On today's episode of Let's Talk FGO, we're rolling right out of Road to Seven Lost Belt 5 Part 1 into Road to Seven Lost Belt 5 Part 2. Surprise. Two. Two. I couldn't resist. I mean, it's one of our classic memes. Anyway, hi. This is Let's Talk FGO. I am one of your hosts. I am the ghost of Olympus Omega. With me, as always, my co host, the ghost of Atlantis, Lucky. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying Fate Grand Order, aka an Olympic challenge. And while we here at Studio Mega like to bring you the latest and FGO-related news and memes, we will be talking about current and future events with the JP and EM versions of the game, so anyone not wanting to spoil it, keep an eye on the Tokyo Game Show. Yes, that's only a little bit in. I don't think any, like, crazy announcements have uh, breached, but there's a few things percolating. We'll talk about some of that stuff later. I don't know. You know that fucking Sony did that state of play because it's Tokyo Game Show time. Oh, I mean, I'll it's true. It. I get like it, it was it. pre the official, but it, it is the week of, so we should assume that. Along with like, uh, I'm sure that like Atlas doing the Refantasio demo and stuff is all supposed to be like based around it. But the the thing that I think for for like us personally is, uh, uh Hideo Kojima hasn't had his uh, now 90 minute in depth panel about Death Stranding two, which is why, by the way, I know some people were like, "Oh no, Death Stranding two at state of play." Yeah, no, uh, Kojima's got 90 minutes booked. He is not going to be scooped. Uh, and also, we've got a live letter from the producer for Final Fantasy XIV coming up. So both of those are what we're probably keeping an eye on along with. And so there are announcements, and we'll talk about some more of that later. Maybe a little bit of a lean show, because there's some pretty speed in the news. And we are uh, recording early, so we're not going to get everybody's mailbag opportunities in. But we've got a, a decent number of people responding to the call. We've got some stuff in the posty to, to talk about. Before we talk about those things, I would like to remind you this episode is brought to you by our patrons, like Adam DeHarp. Lex Doji, Call Me Zed, Carlos Dragon, JDV9000, Justin the Fay, Kaiser, Chris Starlight, Legendary Boss Hunter, Liam Kessler, Rise of Kenji, Rogue Robin Trevor, Shum Guy and Bob, and Dragon the Crow. If you like what we do, want to see some more, consider supporting us on Patreon. Get access to episodes early and lots of other goodies, and it really helps us out. Thank you for your support. And everyone out there on YouTube and in our Discord, thank you for your support as well. We wouldn't be here without you. This is true. We would not have crossed that uh, 1 million total views, which we did a while ago. I think <laughs> I talked about it on stream, but I don't remember if I mentioned it in the podcast or not. I'm thumbs upping right now. Good Thumbs on you. Up. Thanks. I also pointed at the sky while I did the Patreon read. You can't see it, but it, it made me feel better. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna we're gonna keep on keeping on moving on. I could say other things with the word on, but I won't. Uh, because first step one, it's time to check in with everybody's favorite Kohai Mesh. Senpai, senpai, ookidekudasai. Because it is time for break the fuck up, senpai. Break the fuck up for pro tips. Uh, th- I I thought for a second this one would be pretty mellow again, but then I was writing the news for a later point and uh fgo basically wrote this one for me by putting this in a big uh red text box with red highlighter double letting you know it's important (laughs) hey by the way guys people at home the upcoming limited time event halloween rebellion of 108 a dragon girl's water margin yes i lifted this title directly from the fgo website will require lb 5.2 cleared work diligently in these upcoming weeks because uh i don't know how much time you got i think you got like two weeks and yes, it does require uh, a Limbus cleared, so uh, if you're behind, get ready. Uh, basically, every limited time event for the rest of this year is going to push you to clear enough Lost Belts so that you are in a position to get into Lost Belt 7 at the end of the year. Uh, I think the only one that may not have a requirement is Christmas, which doesn't even have like a brand new servant anyway. It's just a, the, they got some extra stuff in there. Do we have a rerun for Christmas, or did they actually do something? I don't remember. We don't normally do reruns, but they've crammed some extra stuff. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, that's your your update of, hey, you need to be catching up on story if you're not caught up, because they're going to keep raising these bars. Which leads us to our next segment in the show notes. Records not thrown a regular achievement topic. Well, that is just me this week. So, finally, through a small bit of effort and remembering to log in uh, every day, I finally got enough hero proofs to actually protect Roland's smile. And with that, I have finally protected everyone's smile. Everyone is max level. I can now rest on my le- easy on my laurels for now. Hey. Yay. Pachi Pachi all around. Pachi Pachi. Yes, it's just lucky I have nothing. I have not. Uh, all my previously new guys were leveled up last time and uh, we're just kind of chilling. So. Chilling. Uh, which also means no uh, all the world's evils. Just keep it on, keep it on. And we move swiftly into, did you finish your master missions? Which, if you've been doing much of anything, probably. But to refresh everybody, to complete your weekly master missions, 
You're going to need to defeat five servants, then defeat ten servants, defeat 15 enemies with the heaven attribute, defeat 15 enemies with the earth attribute, and then defeat 15 enemies each with the demonic and humanoid traits. Those are separate masturbations in case my grammar wasn't clear. So uh, all of these are things you can very easily do, uh, clearing free quests or story quests for your catch period. So go ahead and get into it. Uh, so in the next section, I think I was about to say two different words there. You ever accidentally split a word in your brain and then you put it back together wrong? Anyway, in the next segment section, uh, Skelegrams, news. For JP, very small. We are technically still in the uh, tail end phase of Audio Call 3 because they pushed it up a little, so uh, nothing new on there. But they may have pushed it up to make sure to make room for the KillMath banner, as always. Got a banner to celebrate KillMath. It'll probably be, like, back to school or something in the States, but it's running from the 21st until the 28th of September, so it is almost over by now in JP, but it is here. And it is a Riku Saito Izo banner, and I feel safely like pronouncing that I may have called this at some point because, as I usually do when talking about all the wanteds this year, even if there hasn't been, like, a new banner this year for a limited servant that came out, like, two years ago, you know, he's coming out for us now in the English version, uh, JP is on a masterful sprint to make sure I think almost every, if not every limited servant who hasn't yet had a raid up within this one year period, uh, gets a raid up. So I'm glad that I can continue to count on this process. Sorry, I was briefly confused by uh, it's a new Discord overlay. I don't know if it's trying to, uh, speedball my reactions or if everybody gets this, but now when I hover over messages, it gives me three instant reactions. My options are star F thumbs up. Thanks, Discord. Anyway, EN News, which is slightly more in-depth. Slightly, I say. Uh, which is that uh, FGO has already called its shot and announced Road to 7, Lost Belt 5, Olympus. So we've already, we're in the middle of the Atlantis. You got like three days left on that. And we're going to immediately move into the Olympus. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for, for posting that. Uh, yeah, we may talk about what this is adjacent to. Uh, after the rest of the news, because there there was a minor kerfluffle in the FGO content creation side, but we'll come back to that. Anyway, uh, Road to 7, the Lost Belt 5.2 campaign starts the 30th, goes until the 7th of October, at which point it will be early to mid-October, and we can do some sort of different event that maybe lasts three weeks. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, we're rolling right into the next one. You will have more recollection quests, including super recollection quests. There will be more limited time master missions for foes, teapots, and leyline stones to make sure you are able to catch up. Uh, they have clarified that you've got quarter AP main quests through 5.2 until the 31st of October. So even if you don't catch up all the way before this event period ends and the limited time event starts, you will still have plenty of low AP chance to catch up. Uh, Olympus free quests are going to be half AP. That's only on first clear, but that's what it is. Uh, and by the way, what I mean by first clear is until you get the rewards. After that, it doesn't count. Uh, but the Olympus gang is going to have unlocked interludes. They're going to have half AP rank ups and in interludes. They're going to have double suck chance, double FP. And if you're using them on free quests in Olympus maps, you'll get bonus FP as well. Uh, I do not believe we are launching any new interludes or rank ups uh, for this section, but they will be unlocked if you're out there. Uh, and they've also pre announced the banners. Banners will be Europa Canis, Tesla Helena. Roma's Queerness Canis, and Dioscuri Canis. It's almost like Canis is the only four-star in this whole chapter. And also, we got uh, so few, you know, uh, tied in five-stars that they have to literally dig up Tesla and Helena, who are in it, kind of, but, you know, we had to make space for the four-banner rotation schedule. But yes, that's that news. We're catching up on all the C's there. And there'll be a special video commemoration as well. Uh, I mean, te technically, this next conversation point usually goes more in free talk, but, you know, we don't have a huge mailbag, so I can just throw it in here. Uh, I did do all of the regular recollection quests for uh, number five, part one. I have not gotten through all the, uh, or actually any, uh, of the new interludes, because we're recording the show a little early. I am literally in the middle of the fight in the Super Orion one. I am kind of curious what the punchline is, but there are some new interludes, and like I said, I'm a, I'm a little sad to see that there's not going to be brand new interludes for uh, Olympus, it looks like, but you'll enjoy your, your half AP catch-up. And I, I believe people are positively disposed towards the uh, the new interludes that launched 
I like that in addition to the quarter AP, they are all one or two pips of yes. interlude. Thank you. That is very nice. Yes, so ho- hopefully tonight I'll be able to catch up probably while the episode is editing. But yeah, like I said, I didn't I didn't get it through them all. Uh, I know you lucky took some time to be catching up on interludes. Yeah, no, I've done four. I did um brain. I did Super Orion's, I did Jason's, I did um Chiron's and I did there was a fourth one, but I can't think of who it was. Give me a second. Jason was that one. Chiron was Oh, Od- Odysseus is duh. Because we got to see Space Odysseus with Space Princess Europa and Space 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 Aphrodite and Space Demeter. Or Space. <laughs> space. Like I said, people are very positive about the interludes so far, so I will get yes. to them. It's just like I said, I we're we're recording a couple hours early, so I didn't I didn't have enough time to, to sit back and chew through them yet. Yeah. Been juggling some other stuff. Uh I did not uh get smote by uh, a hurricane, but a major hurricane did blow through the neighborhood, you know, just just a few uh, you know, I think like literally just over a hundred miles away. And uh those things are big, chat. You can see them from space. Space. So, you know, my, my schedule yesterday was a little little up in the air, and now we're here. Uh the thing I said earlier that I alluded to talking about content creation is that I think in the past week or so there was a little bit of a I guess it was a scare rather than a real thing, like a big thing. Um I know that a lot of YouTube channels that post you know, up-to-date translations of new story as it comes out in JP uh, were privating a lot of their videos because it seemed like uh, Los Angel was going to more aggressively enforce their streaming guidelines for FGO. Ah. Uh, which, if you didn't know, we have discussed this before because it has come up, especially with, like, uh, v- you know, partnered VTubers doing streaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, previously, FGO uh, didn't want anything streamed past part one. Uh, so, like, you know, Babylon Solomon border. Um, they recently, I think, I think it was just this year, they increased that to be through LB3, so not even all the way through the Lost Belts, um, and so on. So, uh, I, I believe there may have actually been some, like, uh, uh, videos that were, like, marked or content claimed or maybe even struck that, that caused this kind of setup, so a lot of people that were posting did go private, but it seems like the... What we're actually concealing is not everything, so a lot of those videos, I think, are are deprivating their videos, and uh, instead, what they're going for is uh, something that I think, personally, is better for the community, which is uh, videos posting boss fights are uh, not being allowed, so those are either staying uh, privated or those are being taken down. Um, yeah, good. You inhaled for a second there. I, I did. Uh, well, no, I got a couple things. Uh, the reason why this like, kind of came up uh, right now is because I posted in our Discord uh, uh, FGO content creator Keita Sean uh, making a post about um, on Twitter about, you know, the new thing that people can stream and literally showing um, a special scene from Snowbreak Containment Zone featuring a new character, the new Katya character. And when I saw that earlier, my immediate thought was jokes on you, Keita Sean. I already play that game. That event literally just came out yesterday, and I blew all my gems on getting that character. So I was like, "Ha ha!" But uh, I do think I do think that you know, stop like keeping people from showing boss fights and stuff like way before they're ever released in other areas is a fair move. Because like I said, we uh, like I've seen this in our Discord a lot of times. Whenever new content comes out, like people talking about how they'd be looking for something else and then they just get slapped on the like on the side of a head through youtube recommendations and whatnot or be scrolling yeah. through twitter and just blasted like i had that problem with like audio um with audio call here it's like i just be scrolling through twitter and people just be posting their screenshots everywhere and i'm just like Ugh. and so. for now you can mute uh words on twitter but i'm sure that eventually uh that feature may go away maybe so I can under, like I can understand that people don't want their content their content being censored in any way because you know content content creating is that grind it's that hustle you con- got to constantly be moving it but at the same time there's people who may not want to see said content so it's a bit of a balancing gag that I think is hard to nail right and yeah cuz I I understand like I, it was it was interesting because like I first saw this in a in a a couple different places, like in a different Discord and, and some some posts on Twitter, and like some people were like, you know, very upset by this because they only follow FGO along through like line by line translations of new content as it comes out in JP, and I was kind of like surprised, of like, oh, why? Uh, but 
some people do genuinely not want to like engage with the gotcha or like play the game, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, they're interested in the story, but they do not have any interest in the gameplay. Um, or maybe they are, you know, further caught up than where EN's story is right now, and they, you know, want to want to stay abreast. So, like, they were genuinely put out by the idea that, like, these videos would be going private and possibly moving to a different site. But also, me personally, and like, like I said, many members of our Discord, like, YouTube's recommendation algorithm is both very smart and very stupid at the same time. <laughs> so like you accidentally engage with FGO content on YouTube and like they'll start posting somebody fucking ripped a uh, a music track which they have posted with a spoiler title usually because we often don't know the official names of these OST tracks there are boss fights and stuff and like obviously there's some amount of leakage that's going to happen no matter what and and like like you said we understand the content grind. You got to get that bag. You got to hustle. You know, YouTube likes it when you put out content at a steady rate. But also, it's a real pain in the ass when, like, there are some people in the community who are, like, infamous for this when you post, like, LB 7.77 final boss actual Nasu mushroom boss fight. <laughs> and you're just like, well, thanks for letting me know that there's a boss fight with Nasu the mushroom. This is fake, by the way. This is a fake spoiler as far as I know. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens at the end of Ordeal Call itself, but as far as I know, that's an actual spoiler. Like, so, like, and there's stuff that we haven't, like, talked about, talked about, but we know about, because we understand that a decent number of our broad audience, you know, several thousand subs, several hundred regular users, like, don't know or don't want to be spoiled about things ahead of time. So, we've, we've mentioned before how our spoiler policy works. We played a little close to the vest, uh, sometimes, but it is definitely, like, people complain about getting uh, fucking blasted by YouTube recommendations. So, like, if it's the actual boss fights you gotta cut out, and, like, you can leave up your section translations and probably just, you know, name them, like, Audio Call Section 3 Part 1, stuff like that, which is still searchable, uh, but is not necessarily gonna jump in our face. You know, that, I think, is better for both the people who want to watch the content, but also who don't want to watch the content. Gotta, gotta balance them out. But yes, it's very... it's very funny for for sean to take that shot and then also coincidentally you could be like jokes on you i'm already there no also i, I definitely don't mean any disrespect to uh, akita sean i think they're a, a great and amazing person but it's just one of those moments of like it's it, just, it's just a, such me. a funny <laughs> like moment right like he's he's yeah. qrting you know talking about like uh, uh the the latest event from the from from project Sorry, I forget because it's, it's a snow break. It's snow break. break. I was okay because I, I, my brain wants to correct it to snow blind, which is like a I weird know. offshoot of Deus Ex. Thank you, Lucky, for understanding me. Um, but yeah, like it, it's so funny that it lines up that he's he's QRTing this, and then you know, hey, FGO creators, you want to stream the game? Here it is, and you're like, ha. But yeah, that was that's an interesting one. Um, and you know, I don't always get a lot of action on it. Sometimes it feels like I'm talking to a brick wall. But if you're out there on YouTube. Uh, without naming any names and without necessarily doing any of your own spoilers, uh, I wouldn't mind if you guys in our comments, you know, came back and talked about your opinion on that sort of thing. Uh, like, if you prefer, like, total blackout, don't want to see shit on YouTube, or, you know, you are actively perusing some of these translations of future chapters, let us know. Because this is something that's, like, can, like I said, when I was surprised by a different community's reaction, this is the kind of thing where we can get a little tunneled in. I think I'm mostly have the read of our wider community, but, you know, they're the the active part of our, or I should say the narrower part of our community is, you know, on our Discord telling stuff. So I wouldn't mind a, a, a broader grasp. But I think that's about everything we got in the news. I think so as well. So, going quite swiftly on, what's our mission clock, Adam Omega? Uh, we have just crossed uh, 22 minutes, 22 seconds. Ooh, four twos. Well, let me just take an audible sip of coffee here and pat that out here. Just <sighs> Chat, guys, lads, and the world at large, Lucky has uh, been uh, sleeping like shit. I woke up at freaking 2.30 today, and I just had that moment of, fuck, it's going to be one of those days. Like, to tangent wildly, um, the reason why I asked um, Omega if we'd record earlier today is because Tokyo Game Show is going on. And there are streams and events going around in the pants. And at 7 o'clock uh, my time, which would be like 10 o'clock Omega's time, 
uh, Warframe is doing their uh, dev stream where they're going to be talking about stuff and hopefully revealing details about Komei and the Five Fates and other updates they have coming on. And I was hoping to watch that with Aaron and Laud, who are also my uh, my uh, frame lads. We play a uh, we play we play Warframe a lot actually. We we usually play like every other day for like several hours. We spend like an hour and a half in Duviri. It's nuts. But the uh. So I wanted to make sure that we were actually, like, you know, try to be done with the show before then so I wouldn't have the ADHD problem of, like, I'm trying to pay attention to two things at once. Or three things in my case. I'm usually, like, playing a game or something while uh, we record because, boy, howdy, I can't focus. But I don't know what it is, but just over the past, like, like week or so, I've just not been able to get to sleep. You know, I'm up at, like, up until, like, 7 or 8 in the morning just lying in bed going, like, why is this my life? Why are we here? Just to suffer. You know, my inner Kaz just going all in. Yeah, my sleep schedule is also weird. I had kind of a similar experience today where I just, like, I was having a little trouble going to sleep because it's like, you know, we're getting on the tail end of a hurricane, so everybody was, like, very on edge, and then it's like, uh, I guess it was nothing for us. It was a big deal for other people, but for us it was, you know, very mild. The power didn't even go out at all. It, like, I think a breaker tripped once and then immediately slapped back. Um... So, like, you're coming down off that tension and you go through, and so I, like, I had a little bit of trouble going to sleep, and then, uh, I, I, I was, like, must have been so, like, straight, straight away zonked out, uh, like, I slept through until, like, about 1 p.m. my time, and I did this with my, like, and this is how I know the power didn't go out overnight, uh, with my TV and, like, my PS5 on, like, paused on a YouTube video where I zonked out, which I am usually these days better about like closing everything and turning everything off but i was just so fucking blasted that i passed out and i was like oh shit this is a little later than i like first wake up that said i feel like my current sleep schedule is like how much sleep i get is bracketed by like how long i can sleep comfortably before how dog shit my current mattress is makes my lower back hurt that's usually when i wake up <laughs> we're gonna fix that in the move but for now I'm i'm putting up with it for like another month but yeah, so, you know, uh, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm okay. You know, you warned me last night about the timing. I assume you guys were figuring out the stream schedule while playing Warframe, which is why it came up. Yeah. And so I was just like, hold on, let me do some math. I didn't get blown up by, by a storm, so we're all on, on level. And yeah, it was, uh, it's a light news week, so it was pretty easy to arrange. So, But now yeah. we're in mailbag. But now we're in mailbag. So everyone, sit down and hold on tight. It is time for this week's Let's Talk FGO Mailbag. 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 I fucked up the first time, and I just decided just to keep repeating myself, and it worked. The segment where we read what you have to say and comment accordingly. <coughs> I inhaled too hard. So, I do want to apologize. Like I said, Lucky woke up at 2.30 today. We recorded, we recorded, we record at uh, 4 today. So, unfortunately, this mailbag only was up for an hour and a half before uh, the show started. So, that's uh, Mia Copa. My bad. I'm sorry. I will but. take slight bad. I should have pre-thought of this because I thought of it while you were still asleep earlier. And I was like, well, Lucky's yellow on Discord now. So I know he's not like up and at him. He's either like sleeping or out doing something. But I'll leave a message for what he gets here. I should have said something last night when we were pre-planning. Like, oh, do you want to post mailbag early? So my bad too. We're, we're not always great at this thinking ahead thing. No. Lucky is bad at thinking in general. But we will begin. This first one comes from Monster Girl Aficionado, who says, Dear Lucky and Omega, no question this week, just sending good vibes, wah, 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 and wishing you well. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you. I will try. And you do as well. So the next one comes from The Tyrant King has discovered the wonder of Mudang. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce the name, but I'm just going to say Mudang. Which is a baby hippopotamus at a zoo, which has captured the hearts of the audience worldwide. I believe also her- specifically it is a pygmy hippo, so it is unlikely to swallow your children whole. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, so we've posted a relevant gif. Yes, people are posting are, are posting the mudang in chat. <laughs> I appreciate this. This is this is a strong callback to the very the very deepest roots of the internet, which is you see a funny animal picture and you post it. But this person says, question, hey guys, my question is you ever dropped a manga or show for whatever reason, decided to check off on it to see how it ended? Sorry if I asked the question before. Anyway, that's it for me. Sending good vibes your way. Wah, 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 wah. And hope you have a great evening. In the silence, just Sorry. picture me doing the thinker pose right now. I'm thinking. Yes, I am thinking. 
Ah. I mean, in general, Lucky can probably say, yes, I have totally done this thing. If I am trying to pull up a specific, specific, excuse me, example, don't got it. Can't do it. Don't got it. Yeah, I think that's where I'm at. Like, this sounds like a thing I probably have done at some point. Usually when I fade, like, on an anime or manga or a TV show, I I just stop interacting with it so I don't read ahead. Um, and in the cases where, like, I've heard that something has ended and I have gone back to finish it, <clears throat> um, I haven't looked at the actual ending. I've actually been like, all right, okay, well, it's done. We're going to catch up now. Uh, that is my usual <laughs> process. So, like... <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. I don't know if this necessarily counts, but I kind of fell off of Naruto after a while, and I, I think it was, I think it was like in this group. Um, I didn't actually finish watching this series. I just watched someone. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Just play. Um, what was it? Ultimate Ninja Storm three. Uh, it was the Team Four Star Boys. Yeah, it was the Team Four Star Boys. I just watched that. Watched them playing. What was in neutral Spanish? I'm just like, nah, this is it. This is all I needed. I'm good. I don't see any question in chat. No, I, I uh, Naruto is. Uh, been over for years, so I'm caught up. Um, I had the advantage that once the anime finished airing, which is when I got back into the series, um, it was very easy to just look. It may have been Storm Four. It doesn't matter. It was one of the storms. Maybe it, it was one of the storms. I don't know. Um, but um, like uh, you just go on Wikipedia and look at Naruto season by season, and you can tell um which arcs are the the filler arcs. I just skipped those. Um. Yeah, I think it may technically have been Storm 4, but that's okay. There's, like, so many Storm games. And technically, like, some of the Storm games did some different stuff, too, but it was... They're good. Uh, I think you can... I think they've got, like, 3 plus 4 got added to the PS Plus catalog. I bought them a long time ago because I'm a sucker for anime fighters. I can't believe they're making a new Bleach game that I'm gonna have to buy, but, yeah. Check them out if you're into that kind of stuff. But, yeah, that that is... I, I That's kind of like looking up the ending, I guess. But, yeah, otherwise, no, I like I said, I, I, I either usually stop reading up or i catch up but i've probably looked up an ending at some point so with that we will move on this next one comes from doing the bochi twitch while feeling smothered by december game releases oh what do we got this releasing in december uh that's what i was just thinking uh well if you're on xbox or pc indiana jones and that's when fantasian comes out mm. and that when is. the legacy of kane soul reaver remasters come out oh something a little something for everybody there I know that the start of next year is going to be good. It's going to be uh, wild. And um, they've talked about uh, Ubisoft uh, recently did a presser. Well, kind of a presser. They made a couple announcements uh, talking about how Assassin's Creed Shadows will be pushed back to February, February 14th specifically. And they're going to be doing stuff with um, with uh, Outlaws. But that's uh, wild because also in February, we got not only... Um, like a dragon, Yakuza Pirates with uh, your boy, uh, with it, <laughs> with your boy, uh, Majima. That's also when, uh, Monster Hunter uh, Wilds is gonna be releasing. So February is looking pretty packed. And, uh, during the Xbox, uh, show yesterday, I wanna say, Everyone um, says. yeah, Sin Duality Echoes of Ada did announce the release date for late January, which I'm interested in. Yeah, I'll, seems... I'll, I haven't played any of the betas, but I will track what people are saying about the final release because yeah. more robot games are cool no and i do and i do like i'm not necessarily a fan of the pv pve kind of extraction kind of thing i'm very much in the pve kind of scope but i least i've played it like i've played like i played uh both in the closed beta and the network test and i don't think i actually ever got like actually taken out by another player so that's you know i i i, I am hopeful and again, I do, um, Sin Duality does something that really likes me. They give you a piece of shit garage and you get to basically up, you get to upgrade it into a luxury suite. I'm just like, I want to do that. I love upgrading shit. I have a very interesting question to ask you, Lucky, though, because I saw a, uh, I saw a clip. Um, did you save up enough money to, uh, to help, uh, clean your, uh, robot waifu? Yes. Actually, I have a funny story about that. Okay, um, go when I... before I tell my funny story about that. Uh, when um, when the Sin Duality uh, closed beta first started, um, it was played with network errors. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Sin Duality is one of those always online games. So when I when it went offline, it basically counted my run as a fail, and I lost everything, which included my Magus, which is your robot uh, waifu or husbando. So I basically came back 
into the game and my uh, Magus was gone. So I couldn't actually, well, I could play the game, but you don't have the, um, you're, you're very severely limited. You don't have a lot of tools at your disposal, which is interesting, but also a pain. So she comes back, her hair is an afro, and she is basically just covered in suits, soot for, for, um, from like head to toe. And the only way that I could clean her is I had to go get the bath upgrade, which I didn't have the parts for. So I had to go spend like an hour searching the wasteland for the parts so I can build her a bath so she can, wa- so she can clean herself. And that is indeed very funny. Yes. And honestly, like I kind, I kind of enjoyed the experience. Like, that, that's, that's the thing I think I like about Sin Duality. I'm not necessarily in there for the fighting and stuff. I just kind of want to wander the wasteland with my AI, wa- my AI waifu looking for stuff. Going back and building and building our garage up. Like it's that, really like that game, like that game really hit that vibe for me. And yeah, so I'm kind of, kind of curious to see what, like, what it is. But yeah, like, so yeah, I know like late January, early February, like late January, February is going to be fucking packed. So, ooh. Yeah, fe- January is a little, a little, a little looser, but still got some good stuff. Like that's when Dinosaur Warriors Origins gonna pop out and stuff like that. Uh, they're gonna do the Donkey Kong oh, yeah, that- Returns HD sort of thing. But February is already looking very stacked. We've got Kingdom Come Deliverance two, Civ seven, Assassin's Creed Shadows has moved there, and uh, not only do you have them releasing in the same month, but on the same day, Like a Dragon, Pirate Yakuza, and Monster Hunter Wilds. So it's going to be pretty crazy. Uh, and the story I wanted to tell about uh, Sin Duality about that was I just so happened to see a uh, VTuber Doki Bird clip. Uh, she apparently was playing the uh, the network tests and the betas and uh, a very funny clip of like, apparently she gr- grinded for like four hours to get enough parts to unlock the bath for no other <laughs> reason to unlock it. And then it's just a drum you fill with water. And she was like, that's it. I gave yeah. you everything. Like it's it's a it's a great read. Doki's a no, it, performer. Yeah, well, again, that's why that's what um that's one of the things. That, like, eventually, you'll be able to upgrade that to even further stuff. You know. Yeah, but it was it, it was just a, a a funny funny moment. That was that. Also, could you could you do me a solid lucky and just just refresh the mailbag just just once just for me just refresh it. Only for you, because we got we got one one more left before, but then we we may have a little bit of a closer. All right. So this next one comes from. Oh, wait, I didn't even actually read what this person had to say. I'm just an idiot. I just got smothered by December game releases. I am a fool. This person goes on to say, Hello, Lucky Omega. I hope you are both all right tonight. I don't have any questions tonight. Just munching through the story of Epic Missy Rebrush and AA Investigations Collection. But I hope you guys have a great night. The night is going I So far. It's not even night yet. We're on schedule. Really... Now this next one comes from Mighty Morphin Dave. Uh, they say, seeing Europa show up in the interludes reminds me how I wish she actually looked like an older woman. Even just gray hair would have been a nice touch. Do you think we'll ever add an old woman into the game? Is it weird that we can have older gents, but all the women are either young looking or a chi- or, or child? I will I mean, say it is a little weird, but I'm not necessarily bothered by it. And I think that there are some there are some intermediate ages. Um, like it is it is a a trope. Uh, like, so I don't know how, how universally true it is, but it is a thing people often observe, uh, that, uh, a lot of, uh, Asian women are kind of like, once you go from like 20 to like 50, they're kind of locked in, look pretty similar. So I, and I think that, that anime style artists, uh, take that and run with it. So uh, there are a lot of characters who are just of like indeterminate ages. And I, uh, our patron chat has brought up something that is mentioned with, fate a lot which servants are supposed to be summoned in their prime we don't always remember this because the usual rule is we want our artists to be able to do whatever they want kind of a thing you know mm-hmm. um that's how we get some of our weirder designs but yeah it is a thing where like you'd think they could could find some like grannies to bust out just to switch things up a little but they haven't yet presumably because one of, none of their artists has been like yeah hold up let me let me draw you a real fucking sick granny this is what they call kids call hag maxing. I'm not gonna say that we couldn't do that. Um, it does kind of feel like though that there are other games that <laughs> engage in the hag maxing a little differently, whereas uh, FGO is like uh, not necessarily younger skewed, but like the it just seems like the the art designs are like for ladies. You know, we've got we've got smalls mediums and larges but your age spread is just kind of like whatever man whatever the artist you know figured out we've got big ladies 
and we've got extra large ladies. If your girl's not five meters, if your girl's five meters tall, that's not your girl. That's King Protea. She's going to squish you. That reminds me, someone posted in our um in our general uh, gotcha game. Apparently, someone's coming out with a fucking um Mega Musume game, which just you know has giant like giant giant girls. I'm just like, this is me. Giant women. (laughs) This is me. How dare? Haze Reverb is what it's called, and it will uh it'll be coming out this year allegedly. Uh, the tweet. From them on on Twitter slash X does say dive into a world of epic battles, mysterious lore, and unforgettable giantesses, which is capitalized. So they know what they're about. Also, Thank yes, you. if Nasu doesn't know about this game, he's probably very interested. I I feel like I've read in some interviews somewhere that Nasu d- d- has claimed he may not actually have a thing for giant women. It's just like a metaphor. But like, dude, God, there's so many giant women in Fate. Don't ask that question. I'll send you back to Zone of the Enders. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking Jehuti is the is the true is the true mecha wife. Well, it is great. I think they take that much more literally in the anime, uh, Dolores' eye. But also, I'm pretty sure Dolores is, like, way more clingy than Ada, which is why Ada is different. We learned our lessons. All right. But, no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be amiss having some older women in FGO. Like I said, I am, I am approaching my, my, my 40th, uh, this time around. So, well, I like them young. I, I also don't, I also like them older, you know? Lucky the, has a broad, the, broad, broad range of interests. The zone of of where you you know you realize that like, well, I don't mind the concept of you know being attracted to or dating a younger person. My idea of where that cutoff goes does, for many people, raise up as you get upper. For some people, it doesn't. But I can't. I I'll, I'll say this out here. Hey, I can't imagine being like sixty years old and trying to date an eighteen year old. I don't understand what the fuck we would talk about or anything. And obviously, some people are gonna be like, <laughs> "You're not talking." But I'm like. Then your relationship is very shallow. You're gonna honestly, spend time together, <laughs> and it's I don't I don't I don't understand eighteen year olds now, and I'm only like thirty one. God knows, I'm like three years, man. Honestly, I think I'm probably around like the mid twenties right now in my like my earliest dating range. I couldn't. I don't think I can. I couldn't. I couldn't date like in someone in their like late teens, early early um twenties. I, I believe the golden rule is supposed to be half your age plus six or something, but people also Isn't don't it? follow that one. That's just like a. a I think that was just calculated as, like, a general icky factor. Yeah, I think that puts me at, like, 24, then? Because, what am I, like, 37, 38, 36? Let's just say 38, because I can divide that. So that's... Yeah, 25. Yeah, mid-20s. Yeah, sounds about right. It's like, I like... I like the physical representation of younger people, but no, not not actually, like, entering any sort of relationship with them. That seems foolhardy in the, in the least. Ugh. But enough of that. Let us move on to the last. It comes from the one, the only, Agent 418, who says, Hello, Lucky and Omega. Have a good weekend, y'all. Uh, P.S. Hearing Lucky's List last week and hearing how Samuel Arte said was cool to hear. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, that being said, um, uh, mentioning all the stuff that I've been meaning to read did actually get me to sit down and read a bunch of books. Like, I've read, God, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six? Yeah, that's six um six volumes worth of uh, light novels, and I got another one on my desk. I'm trying to burn through them so I can finally get to uh the Daidoji Shin novels. Oh there. Yes. My was... power didn't go out yesterday, so I didn't advance my reading backlog any. Oh no. I I'm doing other stuff, I'll talk about it in a second. Yeah. But thank you very much. That is the mailbag for this week. That put us to a nice round, uh at least before editing. Uh Around forty six and a half minutes. Alrighty. So still still speed running compared to some of our more slow episodes, but when, when the news is very limited and we, we posted mailbag a little fast, there's only so much that can be done. So I'm just realizing this PlayStation blog is not in chronological order. Okay, fine. We'll we'll freebase it. Uh, cause that means we're gonna leave uh the mailbag zone. We're gonna enter the what's up time. I, sorry, I had a strong urge to make the Twilight Zone sound of my mouth and then my brain just went like, Don't do that. People aren't gonna get that. <laughs> Which is very sad. The Twilight Zone is Twilight Zone is is like The Simpsons, where you people don't realize how many like tomato in the mirror type twists are from old Twilight Zone episodes, and some of them are not like very original these days. But they they had some good stuff for the time period. If you if you want, you know, speculative fiction brain tinglers. Uh, but anyway, uh, first first up, uh, the state of play. This was an interesting one going into it, right? 
because we've talked about how over the past couple of weeks that PlayStation has been real deep in the it's so over, we're so back cycle. Technically, we have cycled back to it's so over because unfortunately the pre-orders for their anniversary collection of the PlayStation 5 stuff has been a clusterfuck. Yep. Um, It's expensive and it's been all over the place, but unfortunately that I think is just every like personal storefront with product like i don't well actually i i think i know how amazon and other retailers do it they have uh ungodly amounts of money but um i feel like every like retail outlet has that problem anyway like i mean you know you and i know this for for other stuff but like anytime something comes up on like the square enix store it's like "Mm, well hmm, this probably won't work right away uh but yeah, uh, it's it's not great, but because it is technically like a cosmetic release, it is one of those things that's not like necessarily in front of every gamer. That said, the collection itself is really sick. Um, but yeah, the the state of play was coming at a kind of a trepidatious point because uh, you know we were up because of Astrobot, but we were down a little because of some other stuff going on. Um, the you know the PS5 Pro was not received very well. Uh, even though I think it's doing things that are like, again, like I think there's actual demand there. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but apparently Sony said when they did their announcement video for that that um, they have access to their backend and they or they've done surveys and um, understand that most gamers play in performance mode for the steady frame rates. So like they understand that you ostensibly want a better performance. So like I said, I, I the market exists. I just don't know if, if one, people realize they're the market, or two, if the market is, like, in high demand. But anyway, we were in an odd space, and the, there was rumors, rumors Rumor. about an upcoming Steam of Play that would come out with a Horizon Zero Dawn remaster, and people were like, oh, God, not again. This did happen, but they did. it wasn't the centerpiece of the state of play, and honestly, I think it moved very well forward, um, and we'll probably cycle back to that one. Uh, and also, uh, people rumored that there was going to be a uh, Days Gone next-gen remaster if that didn't happen don't know if that's like later in the pipe or that was just you know a a rumor but it was out there uh there was also some news stories that the budget for concord may have been 400 million um i have also heard some people say that that number is probably not realistic like the budget for like red dead redemption 2 was only like 140 million which is still super high so like the idea that concord cost you like two and a bit rdr2s or something is a little ludicrous um but it was big. It was probably like a, a astonishing bomb, which makes it all the more interesting that Sony decided just to go straight up and pull the plug. Um, so, like, we were in a bad way, but I think the state of play, like, honestly really saved it. Like, it was a pretty good state of play. Yeah. Uh, and I've heard this this echoed by, like, other people. Like, uh, other... Sometimes I'll see a state of play and I'll go, that was cool, and then I'll tune into some other outlet, and they were like, eh, it was kind of mid. There were too many games about farming, and I'm just like, well, that's just your opinion, man. But this one seemed seemed pretty even appeal. So, uh, first off, they started strong with the announcement of their free update for Astrobot. Yep. Uh, Astrobot is getting five new speedrun courses, and they are getting um, ten new... Uh, by the way, I think we can officially say the term for this, as everybody said things, but uh, the PlayStation blog itself refers to them as Special Bots, with capital letters. So they are Special Bots. Uh, but there'll be ten new ones. This includes some of the stuff that we thought would already be in there. Uh, Eve from Stellar Blade, Helldivers... Uh, some people are speculating, like, Rise of Ronin. Probably not, still not those Square Enix touchstones, because that's probably going to be bigger, but we'll we'll see what's up with, because I got 10 new slots to fill. Yeah, that also, uh, sorry, uh, in our Patreon check, I just brought up, some of that dev might also have been marketing. That I could see also, because, like, that's, when you add marketing to the budget, I don't know why marketing budgets are so big, but they're big. They're big. I, 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 you'd think that at some point we would start to critically assess whether or not our marketing departments deserve to be spending or, or or having that much money flow through them, but we're not doing that yet. So anyway, um, it's true they did get an episode in secret level, but there was also another PlayStation branded level. So I don't know that that may have just been like the console team. Anyway, Astrobot looking good, and then um, I think I'll you know we'll jump straight to the end because everybody knows, and I already made the joke as our intro joke, but the stream ended on a super strong note that I think is why everybody thinks so highly of this. Like I think it was going to be just an okay state of play but then they came up with a banger uh it finally happened our ghost sequel was announced yeah we have to say ghost sequel now yes because it was not ghost of tsushima 2 uh which actually i think is a brilliant move uh it I, is I have thoughts and feelings it is officially ghost of yote yeah uh 
So uh, they have announced fully it's going to be it's coming out sometime next year. Uh, it is going to be obviously you know similar uh, engine and probably similar gameplay, but they are moving the timeline up by about uh, 300 years. It's going to take place in uh, 1603. 1603, Chad, is a very interesting year because that is officially the year that the uh, Tokugawa Shogunate begins, and thus so begins the Edo period. Uh, Ieyasu is named Shogun in March of that year. So, very interesting period of, of Japanese history where, you know, where we're ostensibly entering a long, relatively stable period, but we're just on the tail end of some real heavy-hitting shit. So uh, it's it's you know very interesting. They've already shown off uh, in like their early trailers. Obviously, some beautiful cinematic stuff. Uh, I'm glad I caught this immediately, but uh, they did talk about how you know uh, the frozen north. So he's like, oh, so Hokkaido, yeah, uh, Mount Yote, which is what the ghost of Yote gets its name with, is also known as Ezo Fuji, uh, the Mount Fuji of the Izo region, which is what Hokkaido was called at the time. So it's a uh, really interesting period because. Uh, Hokkaido was not, you know, fully settled by Japan at this period. Um, a lot of people are speculating that probably means you're going to run into uh, Ainu settlements and villages uh, yep. where, where you know, you'll be able to, like, trade and interact with the locals. But yeah, it's it's very interesting. We've got a female protagonist, Atsu. They've shown off some, some double sword action. Uh, also, because it's, you know, post-Nobunaga, guns are going to be a thing. Yeah. Uh, they also, I, I immediately, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio pointed when I saw in the trailer a chain weapon. I love chain weapons. So looks looks like we're gonna we're gonna take the timeline advancement uh, to you know get out there. Yeah, the bounty hunting thing is also really sick as because the way it looks in the trailer is that Atsu has a fucking hit list on her arm and then just mark the guy off with wiping the katana blood off and I'm just like that's fucking metal. But yeah, it's 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 interesting because we are we're doing a gap. Um, it it took some people to realize the time gap was so long and some people seem like real attached to Jin, which is fair. You get to see him go which, through a lot of emotional stuff. Which is fair. Like, I was gonna, like, I like I want to say, straight off, I'm excited for this game, and I, you know, me, I'll be there day one, but I am a little disappointed that we did not actually do a Ghost of Tsushima 2, because you gotta remember, there was, like, two invasions of Tsushima. Um, they were fairly close together. I think, like, within ten years of each other, I think. Yeah. So, relatively speaking, we probably could have done a Ghost of Tsushima 2 with Jin again, but uh, Sucker Punch actually went on to say it on to say that say that you know they consider Jin's story done. And I thought about that. I'm like, yeah, no. When you actually think about it, his 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 story did reach a reach a conclusion. He he like we has didn't go character we didn't... arc, and there are several big climax points in it. Yeah. So I'm just like, no, that's that's fair. And and um. And like I was thinking, I was thinking about it. Like, what would they even do in the, with a second, with a second Tsushima? Like, they probably have like a little bit of technology because the the invasion of Tsushima is like when uh, Japan started, you know, working on their uh, working on their blade game, and well, not in other advancements. And there was actually like a lot of actual battles there, but actually, it kind of just be you know the same as the first. You maybe it was just a different. Game. So I can understand why um, Sucker Punch decides, you know, like no, let us you know move on and do something you know bigger. Maybe better, different. You don't just want to keep giving out, you know, the same game over and over again. Yeah, and and I think that's another thing they said where they're like, we like doing origin stories, uh, which I think is fair. Like, Sucker Punch has done some direct sequels, but I think it's been seen with like kind of how they handled some some of the sequels to Infamous and stuff. They do like the the like the start point, and they're good at it. You know, kind of kind of starting fresh with a new character and. I do want to say that, uh, this was also pointed out in Patreon chat, but I was also thinking about this, there's no Ghost of Tsushima 2 yet, because um, Sucker Punch and Sony did say that they are actually working with partners and are hoping that Ghost of Yote is going to kind of be a a pivot point where they're going to be able to expand the Ghosts of brand into multimedia projects. So, like... Maybe we don't get a game that's Ghost of Tsushima 2, but maybe they will make a... I mean, I think they've already got, like, optioned rights and have a pre, pre-pro pre on a Ghost of Tsushima movie adaptation straight up. Which if you Listen, get Shogun the, did really well, man. People want to see that kind of... Yeah. Um, it's Shogun, the only thing that makes me slightly sad, I've, you know, paused my Hulu subscription for a few months because it's fucking expensive. Um, but, like... They've got room for movies or TV adaptations, um, especially because Sony has already done a very good adaptation of 
Last of Us. Like, so there's there's room for for live action. There's also room for animation. Um, like, there's a lot of things going on that they can work with. Um, like for that, so it it they leave the room for for Sucker Punch to kind of have their cake of making a new game with a new protagonist and letting us do like new and interesting things. The original Ghost of Tsushima was already it did not telegraph this, but it was already basically historical fiction because yep. it it uses armor and weapon styles and like philosophy of later periods in earlier periods. Um, yeah, honestly, the concept of samurai really, really did wasn't that prevalent back then. Like yeah, it kind of was, but uh, w- what Bushi were doing was was not quite Bushi though. You know, like they yeah. had not invented the philosophical concept of the warrior. Um, whereas Ghosts of Yote lets them move up the timeline and introduce, like, tech that will be more cutting-edge, like hitting guys with an arquebus, um, you know, which were already introduced, but also keep their stylistic style. Uh, and also, I- I'm already calling my shot here because there was already some supernatural shit that was in uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which was the raddest. Loved that stuff. Um, but they've given themselves the easiest fucking Leonardo DiCaprio setup ever. Leonardo DiCaprio pointing meme setup ever, where, um, you know, uh, Jin, the ghost, is gonna be a fucking legend now that people barely remember, you know, um, mm-hmm. and so you're gonna have that moment where, like, you're gonna be able to find out historical stuff now, you know? Oh, Possibly I did want to point out, uh, <laughs> uh, talking about, like, uh, Bushido and stuff, yeah, no, it's actually around this time that uh, Bushido came about, because it was uh, Hojo uh, Takamune who was faced with the invasion of the Mongols, who was just like, what the fuck do we do? Yeah. So, like, no, this is the time that actually the class of, like, samurai actually rose. And then, you know, Yote is being set in a period where, like I said, we are we are entering the thinky pants phase of samurai once again because Ieyasu is shogun. Japan is, is unified, and things are going to be locked down for a long time. Also, by the way, hey, funny other stuff that happened. Uh, one, they mentioned there's a shitload of Ronin. Uh, so it's probably related to uh, there was a big rebellion of Ronin uh, late that year. Uh, but also, this is a fun fact for our FGO listeners, we don't know the exact date uh, when it first happened, but 1603 is the commonly accepted year where uh, Izumo no Okuni started uh, Kabuki. Oh, that could be fun. Yeah, so like I said, I don't, I don't know if she'd be, you know, rattling around in Hokkaido somewhere, but it is kind of an interesting space where... You know, that could work with some of the themes because, you know, we've talked about this before with Okuni, but o- Okuni's original Kabuki performers were all women. <laughs> um, you know, it just, uh, it, because it, that's, that's where, like, the, the dancing and performing was. And then it, it, that got so rowdy and so, like, diva esque that eventually the Tokugawa government was like, okay, okay, women can't do Kabuki anymore. It's too crazy. You gotta stop. And I think they tried to straight up ban Kabuki, but people were very upset by this. So we were like, all right, fine. Dudes can perform Kabuki. Calm down. Jesus. We have a country to run. But yeah, so like, <laughs> there's a lot of fun stuff going on in 1603. So I'm, I'm excited for it. And just, I, I love the inclusion of the mountain as like this giant centerpiece, right? It looks so sick. But yeah, this, this got a lot of people back. Um, and like I said, if you are interested in follow-up stuff with Jin, they've got some room for it. Um, I will say it's interesting, so uh, this will come up later also when we talk about, like, uh, the Horizon news, but, like, my immediate thought was, like, trying to figure out of, like, man, it's been a while. Can I, can I, do I get access room to, to Ghost of Tsushima? Um, and you can download both PS4 and PS5 versions for free on PlayStation Plus, um, but you can't get the Director's Cut version that way. You, if you want to do the cheap upgrade to Director's Cut, you got to put your disc in and buy that. So I'm like, shit, I gotta dig out my disc copy and, and purchase Director's Cut if I want to get access to, like, the second island and shit. Which I am interested to see, because I haven't I haven't played through Ghost of Tsushima uh, since it dropped, you know? So that I'll have to budget some time and money for that one later, but not right now. Um, and still, I wouldn't mind maybe checking it out in, just on the PS5 upgrade with some of the, the cleaner stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna be really interesting. And this, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, Assassin's Creed Shadows got delayed for, like, more polish, right? Um, yeah. It's very funny that they are pushing it to 2025. Still early 2025. We don't know the exact frame for, for Ghost of Yote yet. But 
they they are they announced the push after Yote got announced. I'm sure it was in the works already, but it is funny to me. And it is going to be interesting because they are going to be put in a state where people are probably going to compare the two a lot. People uh, are probably no. already going to compare Shadows to Ghost of Tsushima anyway because Ghost of Tsushima is like a blockbuster masterpiece video game, you know, like it's it's mm-hmm. one of one of PlayStation's big crown jewels. Um but now they're going to be in the same release year. They're going to be running in the same press cycle. The comparison is going to be unavoidable. So I feel kind of bad for the Ubisoft team. Uh, I'm I'm willing to let Shadows stand on its own merits because I am interested in Samurai Ninja games. But that's going to that could be a rough comparison. Like I said, Assassin's Creed games are kind of hit or miss these days. Um, I think they've they've kind of like hit a pretty even keel. They've hit a pretty standard point. Where, you know, if you like them, you like them. If you don't like them, you don't like them. And they're not changing. But mm-hmm. it's it's going to be a rough side-by-side. And it's going to be a rough side-by-side for Ubisoft. Probably not for Sucker Punch. So it's 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 an interesting state they're in. Uh, they did also announce the, the remastered of Horizon Zero Dawn they mentioned. Um, yep. They are, they are releasing a, a straight-up proper PS5 remastered version and a PC remastered version. Uh, you can already get the PS4 equivalent version on PC of Zero Dawn, but uh, they they announced that they are like not just like what I believe you could already do is you could already plug your PS4 version into your PS5 and it would like automatically like do some upresing and stuff. It would juice it a little. Um, juice. But they did not design straight up like new technology. Uh, so the remastered version is going to include. Uh, they're going to apply a lot of their like shaders and other like engine tweaks they learned for zero for forbidden west to zero dawn they have apparently re-recorded like over 10 hours of audio and mocap and stuff like they've they've gone back and remastered some of their footage basically and done some retakes and stuff um and run it all together it will probably have ps4 pro boosting as well ps5 pro boosting or ps4 pro boosted that's the thing that already happened um and so like honestly i think because they did not spend too much time harping on this i think this was a decent announcement like it's it's been many a year since the game came out. Um, it's already been four years since the PC version came out. That was in 2020, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, I think there's room for improvement, especially because uh, Forbidden West did come out, and they have actually done, like I said, you know, extra hours of, of remastering work. Like, it's actually remastered. And they did announce that uh, if you previously owned the game, you'll be able to purchase the upgrade from the PS4 version for just $9.99, which is pretty reasonable. Uh, now, there was a funny follow-up to this, which is previously on PlayStation Store, officially, uh, Zero Dawn PS4 version was listed at $19.99, classic uh, PlayStation Greatest Hits prices. Uh, but they did, after this announcement, rebump it to $40, meaning that if you get it now, digital, and pay for the upgrade, it's about 50 bucks, which is what the price point on steam and ps5 will be standalone so you're not really saving money that way but i feel like that's i mean one you know if you're worrying about digital storefront prices those are set by the the you know the manufacturer the the guy who controls the thing so like that's like complaining about how expensive nintendo games are to buy and download they nintendo doesn't do discounts often <laughs> it's how it is it'd be how it'd be you know but uh, i do think it's fair for them to to bump the price up so that it's still like overall the same price for the upgrade because I feel like the 9 in upgrade is geared for people who, prior to this announcement, already owned Horizon, you know? Yeah. They have they set this up so that, like, hey, if you already own Horizon, we're not going to make you, one, we're not making you buy a $70 game brand new anyway. It's $50 on the low end of the price point for a current gen game. But also, we're offering it to you for a relatively cheap upgrade. But if they rightly guessed that people were probably going to try and exploit that to jump on the bandwagon and get a really cheap release of their game and so they adjusted the prices accordingly it's you know like it doesn't f- it's like annoying that they're giving it a, a $20 price jump when it was previously so cheap but it doesn't it does not feel like disastrous to me for them to announce it you know yeah like it's well yeah they're you know they're only charging you $50 for this game anyway now like if if this was a full $70 game release and they were like bumping the price up there i'd be like yeah, that's kind of annoying, but it's already they're already like keeping the price point lower. They did show a few more stuff for their Lego Horizon thing as well, which is very interesting. Uh, they showed off some new PlayStation colors, the Chroma Collection, 
Indigo Pearl Teal, looking very good. Uh, we got we got some more some more announcements. Uh, another Alan Wake Two expansion, yeah, announced Lake House. Uh, this is pretty good because this to me this feels like their equivalent of doing the AWE expansion for Control, which was like a tie in to uh, Alan Wake. You know, this feels like the Lake House because it's set at the Lake House, the FBC's Lake House, which was a spot we both noted when you were playing through that game on this channel. By the way, you can watch the stream archives now. Um, we both noted that, that was like a thing. But you couldn't really go there. Yeah, it was foreshadowing. Yeah, so it's cool follow up. So that's that's gonna be neato. Also, it's just this is just a cute thing I like to say. But after that trailer was released, uh, Chip Cheesem uh, went online to be like, "Hey, I made this. I'm, I made this because <laughs> he he works at uh, at Remedy now and like he is a video a professional video editor. So if you want to watch Let's Plays by a guy who professionally edits video game trailers and footage for games like Alan Wake Two, Chip Cheesem LP." Uh, that's why his work is so high quality because he's a genius or a lunatic or both. But yeah, always always great to see the the Alan Lake stuff trucking. Uh, there was a very interesting trailer for for conceptually for a game, um, uh, Arcade Chronicles. Uh, kind of an interesting look. Like to me, it kind of looked roughly like a you know like a multiplayer action RPG, maybe aesthetically leaning somewhere towards the the Souls game, the Souls Zone. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, it's interesting. This is apparently a sequel to an MMO. Really? Yeah. Uh, I think this I heard is about not it, but... massively multiplayer, uh, but I believe it will have up to ten man multiplayer. Hmm. So it's it's gonna come out. I'm I'm skimming the blog now. It's it is an action RPG, so you're gonna have like you know combat system. Uh, you know they talk about combos, elemental attacks, and stuff. And looking at the footage, it looks like they've got like a pretty good range where they've got some very tight, over-the-shoulder, sh- like, man-to-man melee combat, like something like a For Honor, you know? Mm-hmm. But then also they've got some bosses that are, like, super zoomed out with, like, attack pattern, you know, shit like you'd expect in, like, Elden Ring, Sekino, that kind of stuff. Maybe even going so far as to talk about, like, other action RPGs, like... Well, I don't I don't know how RPG-focused Monhun is, but, like, the action, like, strategic planning of enemy attacks is definitely a thing I know you do, and um, games like... Uh, Nio are definitely, you know, it's definitely on that that action RPG scale as well. So like, looks interesting. Um, got some stuff. Definitely kind of the thing I'm I'm gonna like keep an eyeball on because that is that's always an interesting concept that you know, FromSoft themselves haven't cracked yet, right? Um, or any of their other like major influencers of like, you know, there's the seamless co-op mod and there's a few things that you can do, but they have not like. I don't think designed one of their uh, action RPGs to be like multiplayer first. So I'm curious about the concept, but we'll see what it goes. Uh, that'll be a next year release. Uh, we got a slightly longer trailer for uh, Dragon Age Veilguard showing some combat and stuff. Ve- Veilguard looks all right. I, I'm so like not jaded, but like skittish about Bioware and EA that like, I think I'm going to have to see what like the final review scores are like to see if there's any like performance stuff, like kind of hanging in the wings or whatever, you know? I'm 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 interested in Dragon Age. Uh, literally, I uh, you know starting some very early packing for the move. I've you know packed up a lot of my old PS2 and PS3 games. So like I've still got my Dragon Age discs. You know to let you know also how old Dragon Age is. That was all that was all PS3 era. Um, so like it looks good. The character creator looks like it's got some some depth for the character stuff. You know they've got some some the, their graphical style looks looks very pretty for what they're working on. Uh, but I'm like worried about concerns and also as as somebody just brought up in our patron chat rip my world state this is something that definitely dampened my enthusiasm a little it seems like uh based on statements by where i straight up said and what people had access to in the character creator uh they are super simplifying your world state in that uh they are going to ask you like three or four questions about dai and that's it um you're gonna build your inquisitor you're going to, like, figure out who your Inquisitor romance, and by build, I mean you're going to, like, make them in the new character, a reasonable facsimile of them in the new character creator. Um, you're going to decide, like, whether or not you close the Inquisition. You may be able to answer their, uh, who they romanced, and, like, answer some character questions for follow-up shit, and that's it. Uh, they, apparently, Vilgard's not even going to ask you who you made Pope. It, it kind of doesn't matter, because the Pope you picked, just, they all take the same, you know, uh, Chantry name, but still, it's like, it's going to be out there. Uh, there's there's no proper keep features, um. So it, I, it, I, they have a little bit of reason for like that space, but it's it's a li- it's a little sad to see that like 
even though they kept changing the rules on that importation, the previous Dragon Age games were so built on, like, the idea of your choices in previous games being meaningful. So, like, I understand that that's really hard to keep up with, especially over multiple console generations, even though that's why DAI had the keep feature to build your own saves anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's just, like, it, it feels a little wrong, right? It feels a little off. Um... And I know that, like, people already talked about, like, well, you know, Mass Effect Andromeda did this. And I'm like, yeah, Mass Effect Andromeda set it, the Andromeda Galaxy is, like, 2.5 million light years away. They designed Andromeda set up to let you know there's no expectation that you're going to be carrying over anything because we are going to a different galaxy. So much time and space has passed, there's, like, very little chance that there could be anything other than, like, lip service cameos. Tevinter is in a different location than where we've been previously, but, like, I don't know, man. I killed a shitload of rogue Tevinter mages in previous Dragon Age games. Those guys were popping over all the time. There's there's some crossover, okay? Feels a little weird, but we'll, we'll see how the game plays out. Um, that said, like, it does seem like they are designing the game this way on purpose because they are trying to create a new, a new jump in point, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they're... they're and like I did say, it has been a long time since there was a Dragon Age game, so it makes sense. It's just kind of, it does feel a little sad to me. This is the argument I was thinking of uh, earlier in the week when this news broke, of like, Veilguard's announcement and the relatively decent amount of hype it has managed to generate put a lot of people back on trying the older Dragon Age games, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are already getting reinvested in the franchise through the old games, and it is kind of sad to me that like, a lot of that carry through is not gonna, gonna happen. I just hope that if Bioware is making story choices for us, they make smart ones. Make Liliana the Pope. Free the mages. Destroy the destroy the Templars. Don't be stupid. By the way, that's another major story point in DAI that they haven't announced officially that you're going to get to carry over the fate of mages in Thedas. I know. It seems like it's a big deal. Anyway. Templars good. are assholes. Yeah. And when they start sucking down red lyrium, that's even stupider <laughs> of them. Uh, but anyway, uh, we got some more, some more stuff to, to speed through. We still have, you know, a little little over an hour and a half before Lucky's Hope will cut off point, but I don't want to linger too long on stuff. Uh, we got some more Dynasty Warriors origin stuff. You know, they got a release date. They're talking about their uh, their trailer. The trailers are looking good. Uh, I don't haven't played a lot of Dynasty Warriors games, um, although I've played a few of the spinoffs that, that uh, you know, Koi Tecmo and Omega Force have done. Uh, there were some spots in the trailer that I know got some people very excited. There was a moment where, like, they were on an upper level bridge and they just jumped off to go down to the lower level. Which, yeah, absolutely is a thing in previous generations probably wouldn't have happened, you know? I do think it's very funny that, like, you know, the trailers for these kind of games are kind of open-ended, so, like, it starts playing. And the moment somebody was, like, uh, talking about, like, uh, you know, you are waiting for the man who will bring order, but until then there will be chaos, and I'm just saying, is this Dynasty Warriors? Because that sounds (laughs) like ancient Chinese history. It, the, the the different dynasties of China are full of moments of just, like, everything explodes, and then somebody comes along and is like, all right, enough of that, clean this up. And they clean it all up for a couple of generations, and then, you know, the they lose the mandate of heaven, and then everything breaks up again. It's so very funny that they get that moment. Let's see. Uh, Sakaguchi popped out to talk about uh, Fantasia and Neo again. Dimension. Yes, History of the World. China broke again. Now it's whole again. Then it broke again. Uh, but Fantasia Neo Dimension is is one of those December releases we talked about. Uh, this is a uh, very well repped RPG that was previously only available on phones by Father of Final Fantasy Yonobu Sakaguchi with music by uh, Uematsu. Uh, but it is being uh, super up resed, you know, real juiced up and being put on consoles. Let's see, there's the spooky game Fear the Spotlight, uh, trying to capture some of that like retro polygonal horror. Seems neat. Uh, now, this is another interesting one that was actually much earlier, but they've, they're they talking about it later in the presentation. So, uh, the game Hell is Us. So, this is an interesting case. Um, this trailer, I saw this trailer, and I was like, oh, neat, sword and drone. That's a cool genre. Uh, you know, I, I made the joke about, ah, oh, my favorite genre, and you were like, I do actually like those games, and I agree. It's it's an interesting concept, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, they got a very neat trailer of, like, you know, spooky atmospheric gameplay. Uh, again... I feel like any time I see, like, an over-the-shoulder, like, third-person action game that is possibly RPG-based that looks dark and gritty, I'm like, Souls-like? Soulsborne? Um, this one is probably going to lean that direction a little. Um, this is another one where, like, the 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 kind of, like, postscript on this trailer also kind of made me go, mm, well, I might have to see where this is going. Um, and I, I, I'm 
going to guess Lucky you may not have heard some of this stuff. Uh, yeah. But uh, the, the creative director for Rogue Factor, who are making this game, who I do want to preface, used to work at IDOS on games like Deus Ex. Oh. Um, so that I, th- I think that's the direction he's going. But he says some stuff in the description that came off, uh, to me, maybe a little, a little pretentious. Like, I know for ad copy, you've got to talk up. But it's like, he, they talk about the term called player plattering as opposed to silver plattering about their game design philosophy. And I'm just like, you're trying to say you're inventing Souls likes and you didn't, though. Um, so they've clarified there's no, he phrased it as no magical map. I've heard some people reporting no map. So, map status, unclear. Um, the, uh, there are, there, there's no magic map. Um, the idea is that everything is going to be through, like, uh, rather I should say, they say, we're not doing things with, uh, we are eliminating traditional aids. We will not have things like detailed maps, quest markers, quest journals, and constant assistance. No magical map, no compass revealing all points of interest. And again, like I said, that doesn't necessarily mean no compass, no map but some outlets have reported it that way. Um, no quest objective markers, no artificial or mechanical guides. Um, you will have to rely on, quote-unquote, your own observation, reasoning, and intuition. Um, the environments are not there to decorate, they're there to communicate. You're also supposed to pay attention to what NPCs tell you. They are actually giving you organic information. So like I said, I'm like, this is arguably the design philosophy of a lot of FromSoft games. And also, a lot of immersive sims in games like old school Deus Ex, you know? So, like, it, it kind of sounds like they're reinventing the wheel. That said, this kind of stuff does make me a little like, well, I'm going to have to see, like, how hardcore they go with this because right now it kind of feels like Hell is Us is one of those games that I'm like, I wish I had the secret, I'm 30 and I have shit to do difficulty setting because, <laughs> like, I'm not going to say I'm a, I'm a doofus. I'm reasonably intelligent. Um... Sometimes I feel like I have attention problems. I don't think I actually have, like, an attention deficit disorder, but my natural tendency to do certain kinds of multitasking does take this away from me. But it's like, man, I don't know. If they're going as hardcore as they sound like they're going on, that sounds like a pain in the ass because it's like, what happens if you suddenly have to go piss or your Uber Eats arrives or your cat gets somewhere where they're they're not supposed to be and you miss important dialogue from an NPC? The way they're phrasing it of, like, no quest journal, no objective markers, no record, I'm like, Okay, so hopefully I can repeat those important uh, dialogues with NPCs in case I miss something because something happened. What if you get a phone call, you know? Like, it sounds really cool to be like, we are building a deeply immersive game where you have to, like, sit down and pay 100% of your attention to this video game. That sounds cool, but, like, I don't know if, if every people who play video games have good... Sorry, what was the... Let me double-check the quote. Has good observation, reasoning, and intuition. You know, I am someone who does have, you know, attention deficit problems. Uh, all this say is uh, get fucked, nerd. Yeah. So I'm I mean, like, I, I guess this game probably isn't going to be for me. Yeah, I think you have pretty good intuition when it comes to video games. But I know that you also have attention problems. Yes. Like, it's it's one of those things where like I and like I said, they're talking it up like it's a lot of brand new things. But it is also a genuinely old school game design thing. So I'm going to be like, I have to see how they handle this. Right. And also like. How 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 much they stick to it? Like, is this the kind of thing where this game comes out and all the reviews are like, yeah, this game is beautiful and wonderful. Uh, staple a, a sticky notepad to your forehead while you play it um, and get yeah, an online guide um, kind of a thing. Like, because you're going to lose your mind in case you have to, like, put the game down because, I don't know, you have to write a review. Um, that kind of shit. And, like, two weeks later, they come out with the, like, the fixed nav thing, you know? Um, so, like I said, I'm going to be watching this one but the press release definitely made me take a step back and think, okay, hold on. We got to look at this one closely. Because um, it'll be, if they can pull it off, like, properly old school and organically, that'll be interesting. But also, a lot of old school video games sucked ass if you didn't have game FAQs pulled up. It's true. Well, when was the last time you played a Legend of Zelda, like an old Legend of Zelda game raw without looking some shit up? Hmm? Don't actually say that. People will come out the war rugs and say, like, me, I did this on the full moon two years ago. I'll be like, okay, yeah, man. I mean, good for you, but also, uh, did you have muscle memory? Were you playing an old school Legend of Zelda game fresh for the first time without any preconceptions? Because, like, the original Legend of Zelda on NES, confusing as fuck. Like, I'm pretty sure that game is designed for you to wander helplessly until you stumble on the next dungeon. Um, you know, like, there's some stuff. I mean, I behold, know. in chat already. <laughs> I mean, 
first of all, Tears of the Kingdom wasn't that old, but also that's a newer Zelda game. Like I said, I'm I'm talking about old school. Probably, probably like, oh, actually, no, I think we have to go as far back as probably Wind Waker. Like, like Wind Waker, I think, is the old school cutoff because, like, hey, you're gonna find all this Triforce pieces without a guide. Ugh. Oh, I remember that. I just was doing fucking treasure maps fucking forever. I know it's so. Ugh. Oh, and Link to the Past: The Dark World transition was so confusing. I think I, I, it was me or a friend who was playing it on the original like SNES time. We just missed the fucking pearl. So when you get, we got hard transferred after the boss <laughs> fight and got turned into a rabbit, and we're like, uh, "I'm soft blocked." Hello. Only later, as an adult, did I realize like, "Oh shit, you got to get the thing." Like, yeah, no, it's it, like I said, if they can actually build a game that that gives you that kind of like immersive sim gameplay, where like you really can just be like, "Okay, so I can go through a vent, or I can punch those guys, or I can talk to them, whatever." Like, that could be cool. But if it's truly opaque then i'm gonna be like ah man that's gonna probably be a skip for me also like i said in, in that document they kind of talk about how like oh we're doing you know unique things with storytelling the setting is probably unique because you have like magical melee weapons and also a drone buddy and are wearing like modern body armor the plot at the high level they've summarized it at also not very original uh apparently there was a, a horrible plague that led to civil war which led to demons demons i feel like that's a a a plot line I have I have read or heard before in in a video game or an anime or a book. And like I said, they could have some finer details that are that are not out there. Their design for those supernatural critters without their faces is like pretty striking. So we'll see. But yeah, no, it was definitely one of those moments where like, wow, I don't think I've ever seen a trailer for a game and then dehypified myself by reading the press release, you know? <laughs> but yeah, and I and it's like it's an interesting one. It's it's going to be, I think, it sounds like it's going to be a little bit of a niche hitter, unless it's maybe not as much of a hardcore as they think. Now, obviously, there's room for that. Elden Ring is one of FromSoft's best-selling games ever, but also everyone who's been playing those games since Demon's Souls is like, yeah, also Elden Ring is the easiest FromSoft game that's been released yet. Uh, so, uh, they, they got a few more. They got some PlayStation VR stuff that they didn't harp too on. They got Hitman in VR. Uh, they announced, like I said, the, the Soul Reaver 1 and 2, you know, the Legacy of Kane remastered games are coming out. We got some some updates, uh, anniversary uh, releases. That was technically leaked ahead of time. Uh, we got a uh, JRPG co- uh, series Lunar getting a remastered collection. Yeah! I do not remember these games, but I saw the cutscene footage they they had, and I was just like... 90-ass fucking RPGs, yeah, let's go! Like, that is some... That is... A, 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 I, if, if Gynax didn't do these cutscenes, somebody trying very hard to be Gynax did these cutscenes, man. Like, it has a look. So, like, that's cool. Uh, that is going to come out on uh, 2025. Uh, we got a release date for Monster Hunter Wilds, along with some more big trailers. Yeah. Showed a lot of fun stuff. Uh, that's going to be, as we said before, February. Looking good. Uh, one of those good, uh, fun little, like, out-today announcements, uh, which is also very timely. Another thing I don't think we've ta- had a chance to talk about yet. Uh, but the State of Play also announced that uh, the PS5 version of Pal World was dropping then, right then. Interesting. Yeah. In a variety of ways. Yeah, so this one... Probably shouldn't be a shocker because um, after Pal World was such a big hit, um, I'm trying to remember the exact name of the studio that makes it. Pocket Pair? Pocket Pair, yes, thank you. Uh, after Pal World was such a big, like, standout hit, uh, Sony actually approached Pocket Pair to, like, get into a partnership to expand the Pal World brand. Um, and so uh, a PS5 version, I think, is just the first phase of that announcement. So not, like, crazy, but interesting, you know? Mm-hmm. Cool to see. You know, you, I, I, it's probably not perfect, but I, I think that Power World is probably one of those games that could make a console jump pretty easily. Um, you know, depending on random Steam sales and stuff, I, I may or may not eventually get into Power World on the PS5 or on the, the PC. We'll see. You know, still open ended. Uh, but it's, it's a good jump up. Um, but it is also interesting because one of the big stories of the past week as well was that uh, Nintendo is suing Pocket Pair for patent infringement. Uh, and this one is interesting. So video game patents do exist. Um, you can't patent exact game mechanics, but there are some technological like I- ideas with certain configurations of like the interweaving of like code, UI, and gameplay effect can be patented. Uh, uh, patent- I think you actually can uh, patent game like mechanics or systems because if I if I remember reading this correctly, I think Nintendo is going off to specific patents of capturing a mon- monsters via uh throwing throwing 
a ball object at them and and the second one is traversing traversing an overworld via a mount if i remember correctly because I'm apparently pu- i'm presuming because nintendo is hopefully have has that second patent through that first one because otherwise like i don't know patents are a little different than copyrights yeah well like I said, I'm not entirely I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that Nintendo actually holds several patents of on mechanics. It's just unless they feel threatened by something, they usually don't go after people on them. Yeah, is patent the thing. enforcement is a little different than copyright enforcement. Uh, in the U.S., especially, copyright enforcement has to be very proactive. You have to protect your uh, protected brands because otherwise, uh, companies like or the courts will just decide that like. Hey, uh, you haven't been pursuing this trademark or copyright, so uh, you don't own it anymore. We don't care. Yeah. Um, like it's it's you have allowed your your I, your intellectual property to become diluted anyway, so it's not out there. Patents are different. Those are smaller, much more shorter term. Um, and like I said, it's it's one of those things where like you absolutely can't copyright um, cannot copyright game rules. This is why like tabletop RPGs are like yeah, D and D can like trademark their terms for things, but they cannot physically like copyright or I don't think even patent the idea of roll a dice adds roll a d20 add some numbers you know mm-hmm. um but video game technology is a little more complex so there are there are certain mechanics and mechanisms I think you can patent um Nintendo has won one of these patent contests before against a mobile game um and I believe it was for a similar effect uh, I think it had to do with the interaction of touch controls and capture mechanics I don't know the exact ones um uh, the end result of that was not that that game closed down, but that they had to re... I think they may have temporarily halted sales, but they basically had to redesign their um, their mechanics. They had to redesign their control interface. So, like, if if the courts in Japan decide to side with Nintendo, uh, Power World is not going to, like, go away. Um, like I said, they may have to stop outlet sales for a while. I don't know for sure. Um, but, like... They could just change all their uh, pow balls to pow cubes, and then you've dodged the patent. They're square now. Yeah. You know, um, the mount thing is a little wigglier, but that's one of those cases where I feel like other people are going to be interested because, like, oh, I don't know, every MMO ever. And it's um, true. It's true. Um, some articles have gone on to say that uh, Nintendo is taking a bit of a risk because if they uh, do pursue this and don't win, um, it can um. Like I said, it will, um, what was the term they say? It will open them up a little bit. It, yeah, it, it sets precedent for, for other people to run their copies, so it's interesting. But it is also very interesting to me that they decided to go with a patent enforcement. A lot of people assumed that because there are some PAL designs, which are very close to Pokemon models, and it's 3D modeling, so it's not exactly tracing, but like some people with more art experience than I have like looked at models side by side and been like, yeah, some the modeler for the for Pal World was probably using this Pokemon's 3D model as a reference. Probably not like literally stealing the models or meshes, but like you can be clear that that Pokemon was on their second monitor. You know, mm-hmm. like so well, a lot it- of people thought there would be like a a trade enforcement, a cop, an IP enforcement, but Nintendo didn't go that route, which is interesting because they're usually very aggressive with that. Maybe it might have just been a thing that it was different enough that Nintendo's legal team didn't think they'd be able to pursue a full case. Yeah, because that's like that's the other thing that's happened. Um, it's um the like the whole patent thing. The whole patent thing is actually post Power World release. Nintendo went and updated these patents after Power World release, and it's just now. I believe it just they just went through is why they have like I think they just went through in the last month. I believe, which is why they are able to go through with this. Um, yeah, they're. I, they're I'm this, trying to remember. This, they uh, filed their like first version of the patent. Like they filed the patent like several years ago. Yes. Um, like right after it was. It was after Power World was announced, but way before it came out. Um. So God knows what Power World's like dev state was in. You know, they they filed the patent, but it did not get approved until. I think last year in Japan, and then that patent wasn't mirrored in the U.S. until last month. Now they still filed in in Tokyo, like in the Japanese district, um, but I think they wanted to make sure that they had the mirror in the U.S. because I don't actually know what Nintendo's best grasp is here. Like it's it's funny because at like Tokyo Game Show, like Shigeru Miyamoto has been out there talking about like Nintendo and stuff, and like celebrating their anniversary and talking about how like 
hey, we're Nintendo. We don't give a shit about performance specs. Like, we're not trying to chase that dream. We're trying to make games that people want to play. Um, you know, we're not looking at generative AI at all because that's not our thing, man. Um, like, all in all, he's doing a positive press tour, but also, like, Nintendo's doing the thing with their lawyers that is, like, I think one of the few genuine bones people have to pick about Nintendo, which is that their legal department is notoriously trigger happy with any kind of fan content, even if it's not generating revenue. You do you do a Nintendo ROM hack that gets like really popular, you might get a C and D. Um so like this is one of the things that they're they're known to be uh, about and it is really interesting to see that they've gone for it because like I don't actually know what Nintendo's ideal is here. Is is are they actually trying to get PAL World clocked out of the market? Because like I said, Pocket Perry's in a partnership with Sony now. Sony has already put po- uh, Pal World on the PlayStation, and presumably they are looking at like snapping up like future DLC sales, sequels, etc. Probably want to um, remember how um, their studio head was talking about how Sony is not actively developing, you know, new IP uh, in multimedia terms. They may be trying to get a Pal World like anime or animated movie off the ground. Maybe you know, I could see that. Um, crunching some more merch sales, you know, like, uh, and I don't, I don't know if they like, they did not, you know, spend millions of dollars on buying Pocket Pair or anything, but like, they're in a partnership to try and grow this brand. I don't know what the results of a Sony Nintendo pissing contest would be, but considering that Shigeru Miyamoto literally said they don't think of Nintendo as being in a console war, this seems like they're opening a shot. I mean, Shigeru Miyamoto might not think he's not in a console war, but other people on Nintendo's board of a Zet, um, of a Zet, Zex and you know other and might think so. It's true because honestly, like this, what this move screams to me is they're not necessarily trying to shut power down, but they are trying to limit its growth and influence. Yeah, and, and that's like what said, this move they, screams to me. They may just be trying to because we all thought of Power World as the game that is Pokemon with guns. It was Pokemon with kind guns. of marketed that way. It looks that way. It's funny that they talk about Pokemon with guns because that is a a, a jab people take at Digimon, even though I do think the franchises are a little more distinct than that. Um, but we've talked about this at length. Gameplay of, of Power World is very dissimilar from Pokemon. I mean, like, the like mount-up thing from the team that's in your pocket is similar to, like, Legends Arceus, but gameplay-wise it's much more like like an, an Arc Survival Evolved or like a, uh, a lot of people compare it to, like, what if RimWorld was 3D, you know? Like, it's, it's a survival crafty exploring game. Um, which is very different than how Pokemon has typically been handled. So I don't know. Like I said, Nintendo's lawyers may just be like, well, the patent thing is the only way that we can force them to technologically make their game more distinct from our game. We can't actually like get them to say they're stealing our, our content, you know, but they're trying to like build that separation. And we'll see. Like I said, Japan's enforcement of copyrights is usually much more strict than the U.S., but I don't know how that relies on patents. So we'll 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 see what the results are and, like, what the judges rule. It does kind of seem like this this suit came out of nowhere because, like, the, the pocket pair guys were like, yeah, we don't know what this lawsuit is about and we haven't even gotten to, like, they haven't even shown us what patents were allegedly infringing yet. You know, that came out a couple days later. So, like, it, it definitely, like, was kind of a big, big blah, 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 blah. So we'll see, but yeah. And yes, uh, chat brought up that, like, it is, it is through a, a Sony department, not strictly PlayStation Studios, so, like, probably aiming more for, like I said, like, an anime merch, animated movie, that kind of stuff. But I at the same time, people, like... Sorry, I can definitely see people wanting, like, power plushies and whatnot. So, honestly, that's probably a, a good angle to go on. Yeah. Who doesn't love, who doesn't love you know, cute animal plushies? Well, and that's, that is part, like, the reason why Pokemon is run by the Pokemon Company, which encapsulates, you know, elements of Nintendo Game Freak and other investors, is because the Pokemon brand is so successful because it is so multimedia. Like, they... The video games are the core at which the whole thing, like, the generations, like, pivot around. That is how they do their, like, content drops. But when they do that content drop, it is everything. It is anime. It is new games. It is, you know, they have side games and content. And it is merch. It is TCG. It is plushes. It is little plastic figurines. It's the whole thing. And since all that shit is still physical, that takes time and money to set up. But they make so much fucking money back in the merch department. You know, mer- merchandising. Like, Get ready for the Power of TCG coming soon. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked. I'd look at it. Uh, if 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 they have energy cards, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> but yeah, um, 
so like the the power world thing is interesting and like i said i'm not sure which which brand i'll i'll check it out on uh play, uh patron chat's already calling my shot that it might end up a ps plus game someday and i'm like yeah, i could see that definitely would play I'm it probably, then probably will. um they did pre-announce what next month's uh first run of playstation plus games is uh it's uh WWE uh, 2K24, Dead Space Remake, and Doki Doki Literature Club Plus. Uh, wrestling games are funny, and I already own Dead Space. I have no interest in uh, playing a console port of Doki Doki Literature. <laughs> yeah, I'm good, y'all. Uh, really not my vibe. Um, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting one to get out. If you don't already own the Dead Space Remake, this is excellent. Perfectly timed for uh, for October. Get your spooky on. Get it all. But, you know, already been there, done yet. Um... Fun, but not necessarily shocking anybody. Um, they announced uh, Stellar Blade X Near uh, Automata collab. Yoko Taro, once again, he will do anything for money. Yes. Uh, so they've got an official collab. And to be fair, like everybody, ex- you know, said that Stellar Blade was very near coded when it was coming out, and you know, they actually played out this up. They got Yoko Taro in to like play the game, and he was like, "No, nah, this is pretty good." They did interviews together and stuff. Nah. Yeah. Um, they're also adding a photo mode that will be available everywhere, and they'll got more stuff for the collab. And also, they coincided that to uh, have that the uh, soundtrack was uh, released on streaming platforms. It was good. I I think I destroyed uh, Omega's YouTube recommendations for a day with it. I like you destroyed my history. My recommendations didn't really change that much. I was already in a hole where I listened to a couple of like uh, six hour compilations of like Vaporwave and Mallsoft that are like go back to the nineties. Uh, VHS store, and I'm just like, mm, yes. Um, so uh, my, yeah, my no. shit was already screwed, but it definitely put some blocks in my history. I was like, ah, I see. Lucky's tearing it up. Um, but I was already listening to soundtracks because they fucking put 16 soundtrack to YouTube Music 2. Mm-hmm. So good. But yeah, no. I did I did joke when that got when that trailer came up. I was like, no, it's a ruse. Don't let him. Yoko Taro is going <laughs> to delete your save games. He's going to replace them with an ad for, for the next Nier game. <laughs> He probably won't actually do that. We, you know, uh, FF14 has shown that Yoko Taro can be reined in, but it's, it's, they'll, they'll be something, I'm sure. Uh, let's see. It's, you know, there's some, some, some more updates that are interesting. Uh, they showed off this game, The Midnight Walk, which does look pretty interesting. Um, I was, at first I was, uh, I was just like, oh, it's nothing because it's going to be uh, VR, uh, but it's only VR compatible. You will be able to just play this claymation game without VR. Uh, that was the, and that was the, the one that talked about being handcrafted in clay. It's got the little guy who's got a cup with a fire in it. He's like a little candle holder. That's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Um, glad to see that that's not just coming with the VR version. Uh, doing an update for fucking TMNT Shredder's Revenge, which is cool. Mona Lisa and uh, Mondo Gecko got some new soundtrack updates. Uh, we had a Shadow X, uh, Sonic X Shadow Generations update, which is that's getting a uh, Sonic the Hedgehog three movie pack, uh, a, a, a movie tie in DLC where you'll be able to play as uh, like modern <laughs> super high def Shadow voiced by Keanu Reeves. So, so uh, you know, putting the pin in that one a little early, but that's fun, you know. Um, they also had some gameplay for uh, Towers of Agaspa. Uh, still looking pretty neat, um, you know. Uh, it's a, a open-world, you know, adventure-type game. Um, it's very much, I think, built on the bones of, like, Breath of the Wild, but it does actually have, like, proper city-building, ecosystem development and stuff, interacting with creatures. Looking like a fun, fun little game where you can interact. I've seen some people actually kind of like push back against quote unquote cozy games because they're like they're concerned that there's like no tension. I don't know, man. I'm still one of those people who gets anxious about like real life shit all the time. Understanding that I can be in a video game space that does not have those problems is great. But they also did like straight up say there will be combat. So like there'll be something. But yeah, it looks fun. Uh, The interesting thing is they did talk about how it will be multiplayer and and cooperative, but they phrased it as you will visit a friend's island, so I don't know if it's, like, proper collab, you know, you'll have a multiplayer world, or if it'll be the kind of thing where, like, you know, well, we all gotta, you know, jump in on X's island, because they're hosting kind of a thing. But, looks neat. I'll keep watching that one. Do we have a date on that? Early access this November. Okay. Also interesting, they are doing a, a PlayStation Early Access. But yeah, that's that's the run-through on the blog, anyway, of what was announced. So, like I said, all in all, good state of play. Had some good announcements, had some strong stuff in there. Uh, Tokyo Game Show is going on strong. Uh, like I said, I don't. I don't think there have been any like really break down the doors like uh, panels and and streams yet. But there's like shotgunning announcements. I feel like every day there's like blobs of trailers coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, like the thing I'm seeing the most is that um, 
Metal Gear Solid Delta does have a very strong setup there, so they've got, like, you know, standees, and they're showing trailers and stuff. Um, they've shown a lot more character designs, so, like, you've gotten good looks at the boss, Ava, Ocelot, Volgan. They got a trailer out with got a little bit of, uh, little bit of, uh, Chagohad. Um, like, honestly, everybody looks real good. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've, they've managed to preserve, I think, the original art style without going too much into the high-def zone that it gets kind of lost. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good. There are some jokes about how they yassified Ocelot because he's, like, very striking. <laughs> but I think it's good because, also, Ocelot's a fucking baby in Metal Gear Solid 3. Um, um, and also, like I said, th- this is something that I do agree with art design-wise. Um, they've kept the the boss pretty uh, butch, for lack of a better term. Like, they haven't tried to make her, like, an anime waifu or anything. She's still a, a pretty serious-looking woman. But that was the art design, so I'm like, no, this is good. Ooh, that looks fun. Uh, yeah, I've got that added to my library, but haven't actually played the Plucky Swire yet. I also haven't played the uh, Refantasio demo yet either. Um, I'll explain why in a second when we, we leave the TGS zone. But uh, yeah, Plucky Squire looks pretty good. I'll I'll add it to my list of things to check out. But my backlog is once again huge. I keep huge. making more things. Um, but yeah, I also like I said haven't sat down with the demo of Refantasio. People are generally positive, but also a little trepidatious. I've heard some people say that the game is like like, really, like, bright and loud and chaotic with, like, all the menus and design and stuff, um, and some people are kind of, like, feeling it out where they're like, yeah, I don't know if the end result of the writing is gonna pull this off, but I don't have any personal opinions yet, because I haven't played the demo, uh, but a lot of people are, are repping the character designs already. People like the little fairy, so we'll, we'll, I'll, I, I do have the demo downloaded, I just need to take some time to actually, uh, run it. Uh, I will say, to, to round it out so that oh, raw mission time, we clock over the two-hour mark, a um, uh, couple things on my end. Uh, actually, this is a good, this is a good time. You, 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 know, you got in your book reading. Uh, anything else you've been doing, Lucky? I know you've been, been jamming your Warframe in. Uh, let's see. Been doing my Warframe in, been doing my reading. Been trying to catch up on anime. I've been, like I said, Insomnia, great time just to dead, uh, to uh, dead-eyed watch uh, TV. Uh, so I've been uh, chewing through a few series. Uh, finished up um Osan Adventurer finished up uh Magical Girl and the Evil Lieutenant. Currently going through Wistoria Sword and Wand, or was it Wand and Sword? I can't remember. Wild animation on that one, by the way. Wild. Oh, uh, what else have I been through? No, just 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 life is normal, I suppose. So nothing too much to add there. Well, the thing that's pretty normal for me is uh very funny. So uh I, I talked about how I, I did not uh get into time with some of the, the demos and stuff that have been popping off. I'm glad we can do demo slices, uh, but I have not been getting into that log because uh, I did try a demo, actually, but it got me suckered into a game. So uh, some some streamers have been repping a pretty new early access game that just came out like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's called, pretty straightforwardly, TCG Card Shop Simulator. Uh, it's very much in the vein of like uh, Supermarket or Grocery Simulator, if you've been seeing those. Those, those pretty typical uh, simulator games. But with the added effect that it is also a trading card simulator. Um, the game isn't playable yet on your end. That's something that's in their roadmap, though. Um, but yeah, I saw a couple people stream it, and I was like, uh, this kind of looks like it's up my alley. Y'all know I love cardboard. Uh, well, they got a free demo. Uh, and as far as I can tell, the demo is like unlimited time. I don't know if it lets you... It doesn't let you carry over saves, but I don't know if it lets you save games in the same way, because I don't remember the option in the menu. Uh, and it does have limited uh, progression. Oh, which streamer are you watching? Or whomst is it? I've watched several people play. I first got in it because of uh, Rainer Vez, but you know several other people from from RT, uh, 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 Rooster Teeth, uh, you know, like AWOLs got in there, and I've seen some VTubers stream it as well. Um, but as a demo, the demo has it, uh, like unlimited play time. Your progression is limited. Ah, oh, you're catching up on the match stream. Yeah, I, I, I need to. I'm not, I'm not all the way through the second half of it. Um. Is he going back for a third sesh? I gotta keep up on that. Um, but anyway, um, the the demo has limited progression. There's only so many items you can get, and like I said, I don't think it it saves your progress. But if you do want to check out the mechanics, go for it. I played the demo for about an hour, and I was like, okay, I'm spending twelve ninety nine on this. Um, and so that's the thing I have been playing a lot in my downtime between doing other things. Um, I'm not quite uh like I'd have to to figure out some stuff to see about like streaming it and doing the setup. I'm just playing it for me right now. Um, I know some people do like to see this game streamed, uh, so I don't know. Like, you know, that's something I'll keep in mind for, for future. Maybe I'll start a new shop for to play with chat. But 
Uh, I will say I'm having a, l- a lot less stress playing it by myself because a lot of streamers I have seen do it do do a thing where uh, obviously they are financially incentivized to do this because they get money, but uh, their run is impacted because they'll do things where like if you gift so many subs or so many bits or so many donations, they'll like rip a card pack for you. Um, and yes, uh, it does have a wonderful system of simulating opening cards. It's otherwise pretty basic. Uh, it's got a pretty typical gameplay for this kind of thing. Your store has a level. You level up by making sales uh, and and opening card packs. Um, your level goes up. You can buy more inventory. You can buy and sell boosters, boxes. Eventually, you can get accessories like play mats, deck boxes, sleeves, etc. Um, you can eventually get you know pre constructed decks. Uh, you also have side stuff. Um, the simulation is possibly a little too real because you can have uh, stinky customers uh, and you can buy uh, deodorizing spray to blast them if they enter your store. I do not actually know if it do- if people will actually leave if there are stinky people in your store, but it seems like the kind of thing the game would do. Um, you can also get auto-scent machines to scent you know, the store as well. But you can sell the deodorizing spray as well. Um, you can eventually buy, buy like plushies and figurines to sell as well. So, like, it, it's got all the bases you would expect from a hobby shop. Right now, the only TCG it simulates is something called Tetramon, which is definitely Pokemon and Digimon coded, um, though a little simplified. There's no energies or lands or anything like that. It's just oops all monsters right now. There's no utility cards. Um, they ha- they're they called Tetramon, I think, because they have four elements, so it's just, you know, fire, water, earth, wind. Um, but they, they have multiple stages of evolution. As you go up, you know, there's normal, rare, epic, legendary. Uh, which are, you know, variously color-coded boxes you can buy um, after you unlock them. Uh, so, like I said, I, th- I think because it goes all the way up to a fourth tier, it's technically a little closer to Digimon than to Pokemon, but like I said, it is very much simplified by the uh, uh, the, the elements. Uh, and that also means you've got a lot of themed stuff you can sell, like you can sell uh, deck boxes in, like, you know, four colors, elementally themed sleeves and decks and stuff you can do. Uh and like I said, you can open your own card packs. You can keep them for your collection, and they did say that on the on the roadmap, one of their future features is not only a playable version of the TCG, but also uh, trading with customers. So a customer can come in and it can be like, "Oh, hey, I see you've got a blah 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 in the cabinet. Uh, can I can I get that off you for a you know uh, this guy?" Um, you can also sell individual cards, so it's a little bit like you know the the investing in signals, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, you're incentivized to open packs because you get EXP that way, and also you sometimes can turn around a profit. Um, I say sometimes because a lot of the cards you get are going to have market prices that are going to be uh, under a dollar or in the, like, 2 to $3 range, but occasionally you'll get something like a full art or a, like, first edition holographic or something that'll be worth, you know, uh, tens of dollars, or even I ripped a couple cards that are of in-game market value over $100, you know? So, like, Real turnaround time on your profit. You can display them on charts to sell them. Um, and uh, this is a later upgrade lets you actually, like, when you uh, resell your bulk. So you get to, like, box up your bulk cards in, like, a cardboard box and sell them that way. Um, so it, it, like, you as the store have an incentive to rip packs and, and sell them. And it's pretty fun. Like I said, it's 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 got a pretty good model of the, the cardboard crack system, you know. You rip open the pack from the back, it leaves them turned around, you flip them over, it has a very satisfying <laughs> noise, you know? It makes a little boom whenever you get a new card or, like, a, a, a card that is higher value. They're all very shiny and colorful and stuff. Um, you've got your card binder on at all times, so you can check your collection, that kind of stuff. So, like, it it's a good game that simulates that kind of, like, if you like shop-running type games where you get to, like, be like, okay, on these shelves, I'm going to put my booster packs, and on the shelves above them, we're going to put the booster boxes. Like, you can do that kind of stuff. You have space for play tables. Um, you can run events, uh, which can kind of, like, change the value of cards. I don't really run events at my current level because they cost, like, money per day, and they only may affect card price, so I'm kind of like, ah, I'll save that for when I'm, like, more stable, because I'm still, like, buying and ripping, like, store upgrades and stuff. You can hire, you know, cashiers and stalkers, um, you know, you can have, like, storage shelves. I don't know if the current version of the game has, like, an actual separate warehouse you can go into. You can buy a second store lot, though, and I don't, like I said, I don't know if that's a warehouse or if that's another storefront you can do. Um, but they, are, like, they have a pretty extensive roadmap. The game's only been out a couple of weeks, and they've already done a few basic updates, but they're planning on having, like, multiple TCGs. They already have, like, multiple sets of cards you can, you can purchase, you know? Um, 
It's very simply straightforward. TCG Card Shop Simulator. It is on Steam. Like I said, they've got a free demo you can download. And if you like it, you can uh, purchase the game for currently just $12.99. They're planning, like I said, they're going to be able to organize tournaments. You're going to be able to trade with players. The card game is supposed to be eventually playable. And they're going to eventually do multiple TCGs. So, like, it's one of those games that is, like, eh, it's still early access. But, like I said, I played the demo and I'm like, this is a tight gameplay loop. I like this. I just, it, it lets me just simulate the stimulation of ripping virtual card packs but the currency is truly free. It's not even like Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel where it wants my real-life credit card to buy more gems, you know? Um, and, like, also lets me do, like, it does the thing that I would do in real life. I'm I'm not, like, an investment freak where I'm like, ooh, this card's gonna keep its value. No, no, no. This is the thing I saw several streamers do where they're like, oh, well, I have a $100 card, but I don't have any dupes, so I can't sell it. Me, I'm like, nah, fuck it. That goes on the table. I'm selling that shit tomorrow. You know, because it has a progression system that I like. It's it's simplified EXP, but it's like, hmm, but if I sell more, I can make more money, and I can buy more licenses so I can sell more deck boxes so that eventually I can build a shelf that's perfectly themed. All of my fire stuff is on this shelf, you know? So, like, it's it's very appealing to me personally, and I know some other people in the audience will be appealed to it. Um, I'm probably, while the boys are watching the Warframe stream, going to fire that one up again and get into it because I haven't played it all today. Uh, and I have a lot of fun doing it, and I'm, like... I'm only, like, 20 in-game days in, and, like, I think the max level I've seen is, like, level 40. I'm, like, level 15, you know? So, like, even before their roadmap updates come out, they've got a decent amount of playtime to be had. So I'm having a lot of fun. And like I said, this was such a short pipeline of watch somebody stream it, play the demo, bought that shit. Like, it it was a pretty straightforward pipeline, and I do not regret it. Um, It's actually funny, uh, talking about, like, TCG investors. Uh, Magic the Gathering's Commander format had a ban list announcement very recently that has made some people upset because the cards they banned were all, like, $100 and $200 cards. Um, and it's just very funny to me for people are, like, for, for Magic, the concept of using it as an investment is so ingrained to some people that, like, they are, like, immensely butthurt about this. And I'm just, like, coming from you, I'm like, huh, first time? <laughs> yeah, that's usually how it goes. Uh, you know that the ban is coming when Konami print reprints it at an affordable price point. When when the card price hits the floor, that's when you know the ban list is coming. Uh, it's a slight exaggeration, but yeah, it's it's very funny to see people go through it. And I've talked about this before. Um, investor types are the bane of a hobby. Yes, they will buy product, but then they will sit on it until they can sell it at maximum value point. It's not quite scalping, but it's scalping adjacent. And it's annoying. The The whole point of the game is that you play this game. And yes, obviously, if you paid a lot of money to get a card, some of which these cards, by the way, were quite old. Um, they've been out for years. But if you paid money to play this card, if you are investing in a hobby, you are losing money. Time is money. If you play it in a hobby, you're losing money. All right? And also, your money is going to outflow because just in general, you're you're doing this for the sake of enjoying it. You're supposed to be having fun. And like, ideally... A ban list, a competitive ban list in a format, is supposed to make the game more fun because things are being banned because they're too powerful or they're too annoying or whatever. Um, but yeah, this was just funny to see this microcosm like really hit Magic the Gathering out of, and I'm just like, <laughs> I chortle. Yeah, I will say Pokemon is. I think um, I don't think their format is perfect because like they have their own flaws uh, of like decks that are good and like you know. Uh, problems with their, you know, like, uh, uh, they have a resource system, which is one of the reasons why I don't like either Pokemon or Magic these days, because, like, you gotta make, like, half your deck energy cards and stuff, but, like, Pokemon, I think, has the best way of doing printings. Like, a Pokemon World Champion will, like, post their fucking deck list, and it's under $50. Sometimes it's under $30. Um, they may be out of date, but Pokemon will fucking repack those World Championship decks and sell them to you pre-constructed for the cheap, you know? Um, so, like, the card price point's very, um, controllable, but then they do really cool stuff with, like, rainbow foils, metallic foils, full arts, alt arts, and I'm like, yeah, no, nah, that's good shit. They do some good stuff there. Um, I had a whole, uh, Fail Portrayal stream where I talked about, like, I looked up, like, historically bad Pokemon arts and good Pokemon arts, and, like, Pokemon's got some good prints they do. And I really wish Yu-Gi-Oh! would actually take a note and do some of those stuff. Like, they've got some interesting rarities. Holographic, like, um, Millennium Rares that have, like, Egyptian hieroglyphs on them is cool. Uh, Ghost Rares are pretty interesting. 
but they don't do like full arts or like border breaks and shit in regular Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, and it's like, I think technology wise, we're missing out, man. You could make these cards so much more appealing. And you don't have to print everything that's good and secret rare. You can print cards in multiple rarities and then the same set. Anyway, um, the other game that I, I fired up today, because uh, like I said, we've we're we're at about nine o'clock Eastern. You know, we're about over two hours time. Don't want to want to take up extra time, which we could if I started talking about space trucking too much. Space um, trucking, but I, I mean, we could. Like it. I said, I'm I'm okay for at least another hour, man. I know, but like I said, I don't I don't want to pace it out too too long. Um, but because we're talking about space trucking, space trucking. Which has, I think, people decently motivated. That's a still a concept I'm working on. I've been been thinking about my various, you know, games and things that are a, a source point. We've kind of talked about, like, some ideas for subsystems. And, like, obviously, I think some of this is inspired by, like, I, you know, I've, I've watched videos about Star Citizen. I'm probably never going to buy Star Citizen because it seems like a money sink for, for a game that is mostly own a pretty spaceship simulator. Uh, which is a cool concept, but, like, they're selling it to you as, like, a full-ass game they're still developing. But... Um, thinking about like how components and tech works and like kind of like outlining a lot of stuff, I decided I was also prompted by seeing some some funny compilation videos actually get percolated to me. Good job, YouTube. Uh, I reinstalled FTL faster than that. <laughs> so I've <laughs> I've played cool. a couple runs of FTL today. Uh, and uh, I still have a strong love hate relationship with FTL. Uh, it's a roguelike, so like that's to be expected. But uh, thinking back, like. It's not perfect because you don't do a lot of trucking in FTL, but the kind of stuff you do with, like, simple, like, components, crew, you know, you start with relatively simple floor plans of ships that are run by, like, three people, um, and you can upgrade it to, like, some very fancy pants shit, uh, I'm like, and the way, like, individual components can be struck or targeted is, like, yeah, this is probably a, a origin point for where I'm going, and, like, I think there are different ideas of, like, core ship components versus... Uh, what they call systems, like just cute little upgrades, like ooh, you can get the shield bypass. You can now do boarding and drone attacks through shields, or you can get the advanced FTL. Like that's kind of influencing me to think about like how the systems in Space Truckers, which may still just be called Space Truckers, I don't know. You know, I, I don't have a fancier name for it yet. Um, like that is definitely one of the ideas for a game system that I'm gonna pull on for like different weapons and component ideas and stuff like that. So I, I did a couple runs, um, you know, and I it still it still made me uh, I didn't necessarily lose, but I hit a fail state and it was like, all right, fuck it, we leave. Uh, I guess I'll start again. Uh, it's entirely because of borders. I'm a little out of practice, but also, man, even on easy borders suck ass. Four assholes get teleported into my game. Shit, dude. So it's like I'm I'm like relearning my FTL reflexes, which is I've 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 remembered now. I need to get extra crew so I can put a guy on fucking doors um, and also upgrade my doors so I can seal them all the time. That's right. Because uh, if you didn't know, uh, the optimal strat for FTL when you get borders is to lock all your doors and uh, vent the compo- compartments where your borders are into space. Yep. Fuck them. Um, Honestly, I like FTL, but it's, it's too hectic for me. When I played it, I always got a mod that re- removed the... Uh... The uh the the enemy front line chasing you, so I can actually take my time, go around, explore stuff instead of making trying to make a mad dash to the fucking end line and get blown up by their super weapon. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't know, I may try that as well. Like, I because I think the game is better when you can take a time to like jump out. FTL is a game, like I said, I I talked about being in easy mode because easy mode's not easy. You still die. Um, like the they call it easy, but easy should be the baseline because you start with extra scrap and you get zero score multiplier at the end time normal gives you a score multiplier, which indicates to me this is not normal. Um, but like I said, there's some stuff in there. Um, but it, FTL is a weird game that I like for a lot for its concepts, and it does a lot of cool stuff. And I've, I've, I realized that um, this did carry over to my data files. This is still in my profile. But I think I fucking edited my cells to like unlock all normal ship types um, because I never was able to fucking unlock any of those previously. Um, now that I play them because I don't know what the fuck I'm doing there either. But they're cool. They've got cool concepts. But, like, I, I, I was watching a video the other day, uh, actually earlier today, and it was like, oh, yeah, so, like, even on easy, the developers tuned FTL that you finish a success, you, like, succeeded a run, like, their projections are, like, 10% of the time, and I'm just like, yeah, no, that sounds about right, but also, man, that's rough. That's why I, I don't have a lot of successful runs of FTL, because it takes a long time. Um, so, like, I will probably poke it and try some more with it, because it is... 
when you get it going, it's fun and funny, and there's so many fun things. Uh, every single time I have gotten in a run when they do giant spiders, I'm like, nope, I'm leaving. I'm not doing the giant spider event. I know that'll fuck your shit up if you're not ready, and I'm never ready. So, like, I don't, I don't know if I want to do some mods to, like, make it a little more relaxing to play, or just I'm going to be, like, faster on my, like, nope, we're resetting the run. Um, but like I said, yeah, no, I was thinking about FTL, so it, I reinstalled it and played it, and I was like, ah, oh, yes, this is why I I, uninst- I stopped playing FTL. I like this game, but also I hate it, because, you know, and there's stuff there. And But like I said, it does, it does, though, I think is one, or I should say, it is one of the spiritual leeches to my idea for a space trucking tabletop game, because like I said, the, the ship designs for uh, FTL are fairly straightforward. You've got pretty simple deck plans. Um, arguably your crew at three is undercrewed because you got a lot of stations you can't man but the the idea of like where they've got their subsystems what your crewmen can do and like what their skill sets are is like and where all the components go is i'm like yeah that's kind of the thing and it also has the power management that like i said i'm my rough idea for mechanics for what the space trucker rpg will be like are still loosey-goosey i know for a, for a, i'm reasonably certain it's gonna be percentile based and i'm gonna have a skills you know a, a standardized skill list there's probably going to be some static attributes i don't know what what your you know strength and uh you know dex and int equivalents will be called but it'll have stuff like that um there will probably be some kind of system to like either well you'll be picking no matter what but like to rapidly pick a handful of packages of skills for like you know your home world your job history what major faction or minor faction you align yourself with that kind of stuff um there may or may not be, like, unique little traits or perks to acquire. Don't know for sure. I do like perks, but also those can be hard to, like, work into stuff. Um, though certainly, like, giving giving you something besides just skill points to spend EXP on is important, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's probably going to have a robust uh, sort of uh, body mods inclusion. Um, body mods. Not just because... Uh, not just because Lucky likes those, but also because I've tried that with some similar percentile games, and it's a, it is a pretty fun way to like give yourself upgrades that are not necessarily tied to experience, but also to money, and also to answer the question of like, well, on the critical hit chart, it says that the the plasma plume, uh, from the ship's engines malfunctioning, it's blown off my right arm. What do I do now? Yeah, did you guys remember to pay to get the DRM on your Limb Cloner 5000 unlocked? No? Okay, you're going to need a robot arm. <laughs> Here, look at this catalog of robot arms. Would you like the the medical normal, or do you want to clamps? You know, shit like that. Like, it, it's... I like these sorts of things, and there's a lot of way you can work in, like, you know, cyberware, bioware, even some nanoware. I'm probably not going to go all gray goo, because that gets a little... Nanoware is fun, but it is... If you go advance the the technology tree too far down the nanotech sphere, shit gets a little weird. Like if you have actual like smart nano swarms and like nanoscale assembler factories and and other shit, you get a little like I said, you get a little weird. And also, there's the question of like, well, how come nobody's built a gray goose scenario? I, I'm actually trying to avoid leaning too heavily on space horror. I love space horror. I don't need to write a new whole new RPG to run space horror. You know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like. Simple stuff like like soldier boosts and like simple augmentations to like improve your your genes and like muscles and stuff. Probably pretty normal, you know. Cybernetics will be out there. Uh, you know, in the background, I've talked about questions of of like different you know splats you can pick. You know, eventually, like obviously, you'll be able to pick you know baseline humans, and there may be some like adapted versions of people you can start out with. You know, people adapted to different climates or like. Maybe there's a self-sustaining population of humans who have gotten, you know, gene modded to be photosynthetic or something, and so they're, like, blue or green. Actually, they wouldn't... I'm leaning a little more on the hard sci-fi angle. They wouldn't be blue. Blue is a... If you actually want to photosynthesize, blue is a bad color to be, because blue light's very energetic. You want that blue. It would probably be, like, green like our chlorophyll or, like, you know, purple or something. Anyway, but then there's also, like, room for playing uplifted animals. I don't know if anybody's actually looked at the... I do have a section for, because I got a wild idea for pre-gen characters I'm going to use to, like, as examples. One of them is a uh, hyper-intelligent, uplifted German Shepherd named Rover. That'll be a funny character to figure out how I'm going to backfill that design for. But yeah, so, like, you could play a dolphin in a robot suit, in a reverse diving suit. That could be funny. Um, There will be both uh, General AI, which I wrote an acronym for as GAI, and so I think that a generalized AI will just be called 
guys. <laughs> but you could also be a, a simulacra, a sim, or an uploader, which is a uh, emulated mind state of a human. The process for that usually involves uh, traumatic destruction of your brain matter. So there's usually not multiple mind clones running around. But that could be a thing. Like, we're not full eclipse phase where, like, death is an inconvenience yet. Yeah, technical gym, you could do that. Uh, and uh, Octopi are very intelligent, and that's something I think that Eclipse Phase uh, correctly did peg, where uh, uh, you could uplift a giant octopus. Those guys are big. Yeah. Again, you know, talking about like like possible like perks and traits and stuff, and it'd be like, okay, so you know, you're you're an uplifted octopus. Uh, you can uh, you got a lot of arms, so you can do a lot of stuff. Um, you want to move fast in in not water? Can't do that. You gotta you gotta you gotta slowly suction cup your place places or get a jetpack. You probably can't uplift an insect because our actual insects don't have enough uh, square cube space to stick a bigger brain. You could probably pl- play an AI controlling a swarm of insect-sized robots. And there will be things like ship AIs. Um, I, st- I straight up mentioned somewhere in the asides about, like, some people go all ship mind where they literally just, you know, do a brain rip and plug their new bra- their digitized brain into the ship, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and stuff like that. You know, we've, we've worked through, I worked through the life support and habitation section. I know it, it is, I've talked before about getting that kind of feedback from prospective players. Uh, I was already planning on a little bit of conversation about like the feeding and dining situation as part of the long-term habitation, but I definitely put some extra attention to detail into that segment because earlier that day, as an aside, Axe was like, oh, well, you know, would, would we be doubling up on specializations? Like, you know, would, would it be possible to play a, a you know, a, a cook? And I was like, I don't think that's going to be, like, necessarily going to require, like, a full-up, like, roll doubling up, you know? That's not going to be mm-hmm. that deep, but uh, it probably would be something you could spec in. So, yeah, like, I, I made sure to talk about, like, what is a space galley going to be like? Well, you're going to have probably, it's, it has to be all electric. Open flame on a spaceship? Bad. Don't do that. You're in an enclosed environment. Uh, do not do this. So you're probably going to be running off like everybody's going to have an electric hot plate and an electric kettle. Yeah, electric kettles. But past that, it can get a little more complex. You might have like a oven unit, which is probably both a microwave and also possibly an air fryer and other shit. You know, you might get more complex machines. Uh, if you can afford it, you might get a, you know, a, a, a wet fab, a 3D printer that specializes in organic materials to like print your food. Uh, you know, some of you are probably going to be eating for cheap and be eating, like, dog shit. You know, you're going to be eating, you know, bars made of, like, vegetable shortening and uh, insect-based protein powder mixed together. Probably tastes like shit, and it's not super probably. healthy for you, but you won't die. To, like, I mean, literally on the ISS, they, they have vacuum-packed freeze-dried meals that are, like, you know, steak in a pouch, trail mix in a pouch, spinach in a pouch, and you eat it. And you've got, you know, your your uh, orange flavor aid drink mix. Uh, I did mention about how, like, yes, there is artificial gravity, but you could always have a gravitics failure, so carbonated drinks are not usually done on ships. Um, so there will probably be some sort of alternative to, like, colas and carbonated energy drinks. Maybe you just drink the monster energy of the future flat. Um, and, like, your, your space beers are all flat. Uh, I did make sure to make a note that, like, it is discouraged to drink alcohol while on shift or piloting the ship. But alcohol is sterile and is a known relaxant, so lots of ships like to keep a booze ration just in case. <laughs> um, but also because, again, electric kettle and you need some amount of liquid, because you need liquid water anyway, otherwise you also die, um, electric kettle and, like, coffee or tea or substitutes are going to be common. Like, you are going to be slamming back space coffee. And and there's there's a few other things you know and and you guys have talked a little and I've kind of been listening into like I I think definitely an aspect that I like of a lot of these types of video games I play that have this thing is the gameplay loop of like okay you're gonna start with a starter ship that is probably going to be very economical possibly crappy I was about to say you mean economical you mean shit you know it it has to be functional but there will probably be options where you can probably take a very crappy cheap ass ship and like either get more starting money or like get the ability to start customizing and upgrading it earlier because you know that's a that's a tried and true uh ism of space trucking that goes all the way back to like the millennium falcon you know leia sees it sitting in the hangar bay and says you came in that thing you're braver than i thought because you know supposedly in universe the millennium falcon looks like a piece of shit it's like a a technically they retcon this a little with solo where like lando calrissian ran it as like a luxury high-end ship and han is just like slowly let the 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 
dirt and grime accumulate so it looks shabbier. Um, but like the Falcon's supposed to be like an old, out of date workhorse type ship that that Han deliberately runs maybe a little grubbier than he than he expects because he's made you know lots of modifications like uh, illegal weapon mounts, boosted engines, the smuggling compartments in the floorboards, kind of shit. You know, um, so like that's definitely a a aspect of space trucking that is pretty normal of like, okay, so you've got the flying brick 9,000. Um, it's crap. It turns like dog shit, but you had a little extra spending cash. So maybe you've hired some extra crew or, you know, you've hidden something in there, or maybe you just can afford afterburners for your engines and can uh, hide a rocket pod somewhere on the ship, you know, but there will probably be options that are like, give you less wiggle room in your starting cash, both as a crew and as individuals, but is more comfortable. But also there may be ships that are not like that are not like crappy, like they're not like low quality. They're just gonna be Spartan. Like I talked about this like like in the living section of like, yeah, even if you get a big ship that's long range, if you have like a long range jump miner, a ship that's designed to like teleport into, you know, FTL the new systems and, and slurp up asteroids for mining, um, that's probably not very comfy. That's probably very utilitarian. You're gonna have tread steel walls and like, you know, flip down racks, um, and, you know, like, you're not going to have showers. You're going to have, uh, what do they call them? The bath bags, I think. Pre-pouched, you know, water and, and soap mixture that you, you sponge on yourself. And you're going to like it. Uh, but it'll probably be very good at mining asteroids. You know, and, and there's, there's, there's lots of options. But you guys have already kind of, like, talked about it, getting on that treadmill. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's probably an intended gameplay loop. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as we go through the systems, uh, I'm, I'm almost done with tech. And then we'll probably go and backfill and start doing... Uh, Notes about factions and probably start like shaping something remotely resembling a like a character sheet and skill list so I can start doing like homeworld, species rules, stuff like that, and then start like turning this into a game system as opposed to just me eyeballing. And I may end up, you know, working on like like where ship stats go. I've got a, I've got ideas, but we're also still kinda loosey goosey. Um you know, you lucky talked about uh, how you think that kind of like the way upkeep from red markets works is probably a good idea, and I'm like, I think I agree. Oh yeah. Like just rather than making you nickel and dime pay for like, hey, you need to pay for fuel, you need to pay for oxidizer, you need to pay for coolant, you need to pay for air, you need to pay for uh, electric. No, 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 no. Your ship is gonna have an upkeep score that's gonna cost you so much universal credits, money units per like docking phase, you know, or per like leg of your journey. So, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just going to amalgamate all the stuff I talk about of, like, you need fuel, you need to keep your batteries topped up, you need coolant. Because, like I said, we're we're leaning into harder. There are some conceits just for the sake of, like, having the ability to do interstellar space trucking. But also, like, there are things that are just, just hard to dodge without coming up with some fucking sci-fi magic bullshit. Heat is one of those things. Um, cooling systems are very efficient, but it's it's a process where, like, hey, if you run your engines and your reactors too long and too hot, your ship is going to get unlivable, so you got to vent heat. you got to radiate heat, so you got to chill out, as they call it. Um, but there are built-in phases where chilling out works. You know, I talked about how the quantum jump, pretty extensively what my ideas for the, the reasonable rules of quantum jumping are. Uh, so quantum jumps are stopped by uh, what we call gravity transition zones, which are the borders of significant gravity wells. So you cannot quantum jump from the dead center of one solar system to the dead center of another solar system. Uh, there's a rough border to solar systems, which is roughly like 100 a astronomic units to like 120 astronomic units. So, and then you got to manually fly through the gravity transition zone, and then you can quantum jump inside the solar system, but you can't go deep within the gravity well of a planet. Uh, for Earth-sized planets, the border is we're going to use the Kármán line 100 kilometers up. So you can appear in orbit above a planet, but you can't, like, teleport into the atmosphere. Uh, you can't, like, light speed huck rocks at people because it'll get caught up in the gravity transition zones and there's interdictors and shit. Um, and uh, I also just built in a system that's like, hey, so we don't know if this is a rule of physics or if the people who designed the quantum jump drive, because, uh, again, this is going with ancient precursors because I love this shit and also it's a good way to make money. Um, humans discovered, you know, the ability to make gravity plates and FTL drives just sitting in a warehouse on Callisto. Aliens put a plate there that was like, here's how you use this. And we were Actually, like, it's more like, I don't know if I call it a warehouse, kind of more like a time capsule. That's not yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, it, it is more like a time capsule, yeah. But they like left it here. It was just like, okay, uh, there's intelligent life in the solar system. 
or there's a habitable planet in the solar system. If you happen to evolve complex enough to reach the space age, we left you some goodies in a bag somewhere. Um, it's a which, gift basket. Which lets me do very fun stuff, because like, it is canonical that gravity plates, right, uh, gravitics, the most efficient way to make gravity plates is with gravity plates. So how did the first gravity plate get built? I, like, I love sci-fi like, brain benders like that one, um, but w- this is a, there's a rule. If you try to enter a closed time-like curve, aka if you try to form a time loop, or you try to change time, um, your quantum drive does something funny, and it either doesn't work, or you uh, are evaporated into quantum foam. Do not attempt to time travel. It's bad. If you're lucky, you will actually time travel and be jumped to an alternate timeline, which is a different universe. However, all uh, people who have claimed to have come from a different timeline or universe have been uh, demonstrably false and are probably just suffering from jump psychosis. Listen, man... I'm pretty. We're pretty sure that whatever's on the other side of the quantum jump is just the vaporwave dimension. Yes. Well, and I did talk about this. Like, I, I, FTL is one of those things that is mostly not permissible in our under, current understanding of physics. There are a couple ways to get around it. Um, like the the actual like the warp drive, the Alcubierre drive would hypothetically let us avoid the problems of FTL travel, but could still do some weird stuff with informatics. So, like mm-hmm. the way the quantum jump drive works is basically. You enter a like, you know, you enter a quantum space, which is probably a higher dimension or perhaps a very tiny dimension where you like travel through, you know, wormholes to your destination. The analogy I constantly use is it's like it's like water going to Earth. Your computer finds the easiest route through the quantum dimension to just scoot you somewhere. And technically, as you cross longer distances, this gets faster. So you are technically super luminal. But when you're doing the jump, You're inside the jump effect. Um, This is an actual thing of real-life physics as well. Um, In quantum mechanics, there's a concept of information. Information also cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So, like, when you're inside the jump effect, when you are quantum jumping, information cannot enter your ship or exit your ship or your ship's immediate area of effectiveness. So, like, outside, no, there's no light, there's no data streams or anything that crosses you. Uh, but organic brains see this as the vaporwave dimension, basically a splash of color that most people say is RGB, but some people also see colors they interpret as the equivalent of uh, CMY. And I talk about how that could just be your brain, you know, the human brain trying to understand the concept of uh, anti-red, anti-blue, and anti-green, because uh, quarks are named that way. Uh, quarks don't actually have colors. Quantum chromodynamics is just a way to wrap your brain around something. Uh, quarks are actually smaller than the wavelength of visible light, so they have no color at all. But it makes for funny metaphors. And so it is canonical that, like, when sapients are in the jump, quantum jump, looking out their windows, it's just weird out there because their brain cannot interpret the concept of no information correctly. Uh, computers, cameras, and artificial life forms don't see anything. It's black out there. We're just terrifying its own right. See, it's space horror without actual space horror. Yeah, no. Like, I like the concept that space is weird and we got to come up with hard and fast rules because not that I see like necessarily my immediate players doing this, but hypothetically when you're writing, you're going to run into people who are going to ask you questions about like, well, if you have FTL, do you have time travel? And I'm like, no, why? Uh, because the quantum jump drive doesn't let you do that. And uh, human physicists are not yet advanced enough to figure out why it doesn't let you do that. It just doesn't. <laughs> if you try to time travel, you explode or it just doesn't do it. Uh, it's the same with the, There is technically FTL radio, the Ansible, but it's kind of spotty because you have to know exactly what the relative position in space of your target is. So it's really hard to, like, send messages out to fleets and ships that are jumping everywhere. But it's a great way to call home if you're out there. Um, It's uh, also, uh, sometimes it just fails to send the message. Like, you'll punch it into the computer, and then it just goes, "Eh, eh, failed to send. Um, And, like, if you tried to, like, break the informational barrier and like fuck with causality it just won't it won't let you so there's like there's limits to promote a space trucking atmosphere without worrying about the the quirks of our hard and fast physics rules there is one thing that i have stuck to pretty straightforward which is the concept of stealth as we understand it in ground combat or air combat doesn't exist space is not an ocean in that sense you cannot do submarine warfare um but also I do think that sci-fi writers and sci-fi fans, nerds on the internet who like to go push up glasses, there's no stealth in space. I think they like to take that too literally. Like, I've done a decent amount of research on this. Yes, um, right now, our big telescopes can complete a complete survey of the night sky in about four hours. 
And space is so abysmally cold that despite the fact that by our understanding, Voyager 2 has left our fucking solar system and he only has a uh uh like a 20 kilowatt battery or something. We can still find that guy. Our telescopes on Earth can still pick out where Voyager 2 is. So like hiding in space is hard. Um any kind of system that generates enough thrust is going to generate enough heat. Somebody will probably notice you eventually. And even then, guess what? The temperature you need to be livable in space is going to stand out like a light bulb uh, against a, the background of cosmic background radiation. So eventually, somebody's going to see you. But just because they see you doesn't mean that they see you, you know? Uh, first of all, they got to be looking for you. Uh, they got to realize that you're there. And also, like I said, people are like, oh, you can do an entire night sky survey. Ah, so that only works at night, right? Do you do surveys during the day? Well, no, then the sun's up. Mm-hmm. So, like, <laughs> hiding in the star, you know, or hiding behind planetary bodies, blending in with traffic in populated areas is going to be possible. I, I, I'm I, working my way through. Uh, I stopped because we, I wanted to step down and, and eat food before we, uh, recording the episode. But I was working my way through a section I added for defenses. Uh, I talked a lot about what they call the protection onion. The protection onion is more for, like, Navy ships or uh, armor, but it works, I think, for space. Where it basically the order goes like, avoid an encounter, avoid being seen, uh, avoid being acquired, avoid being hit, avoid armor penetration, etc. The last layer of the onion is uh, avoid dying, you know, avoid the kill. But it seemed like a good way to step through the diagram. So like, conceptually, there are possibilities to do stealth type things. Um, technically, the gravi- if you have a gravity core, you can do a reactionless drive, so there's no drive emissions. Uh, though obviously your gravity core is going to be plugged up to something electric, which means that you are probably generating a lot of heat that way. But maybe you're not. Maybe you've got, like, cold gas jet systems to, like, do uh, RCS. You can have a very good heat sink to contain all of your heat radiation. Eventually, uh, you're going to have to vent that heat or you'll die. This is the way uh, Mass Effect does this. But you can get kind of sneaky for a limited amount of time. Uh, But, like, no matter what, like... Even if you are, like, you paint your fucking hull black so nobody can see you with their eyeballs, somebody's going to be able to look at their scope and be like, well, I don't see a ship out there, Captain, but there's a mysterious, you know, dart-shaped or wedge-shaped shadow that keeps blocking the background stars. I think they might be there. So, like, perfect stealth is going to be impossible, except for possible black box precursor tech that is, like, an actual cloaking device, you know? Like, I'm not going to say it's there's never going to be a, a sci-fi wooge stealth system, but that would be a MacGuffin for, like, a campaign or a, or a major plot. It's not publicly available, but, you know, it, it's a fun rundown, but mostly it's tactical. But, yeah, we're still working through through the stuff. And there are also, you know, got to talk about other uh, fun defense systems. Decoys, chaff, point defense. You can kind of have shields, kind of. Uh, the primary two forms of shielding is either you can use your gravity core to create a fake GTZ, which will, like, throw off uh, projectiles with mass, doesn't do anything against lasers. If you want to block lasers, you can do plasma barriers. Uh, you can just magnetically shield plasma to, you know, block laser beams and particle beams. Uh, problem. Uh, plasma is not inherently see-through, oh. so it blocks your uh, fields. And also, uh, as far as I can tell, there's no way to make a plasma window one way. So if you put your plasma barriers directly in front of your guns, you also can't shoot out of it. Mm. But it's the kind of thing where you can, like, put up plasma screens and, like, interlocking barriers like a beehive and leave slots open for guns and sensors, or you can throw them up in front of, like, critical systems when you realize, like, oh, hey, that asshole's shooting a missile at us. Instead of pop flares, throw up a plasma barrier. Like, I I think I've got in my mind a decent system of, like, like I said, weapon triangle and, like, defense systems, so, like, it's all about, like, balancing out your options, trade-offs, and figuring out what you want to do, you know, uh, ordnance, you can carry a lot of payloads. They can be very damaging and stuff, and you can do a lot of other funny options. But they do have mass, so you have limited ammo, and you know they're susceptible to things like jamming and countermeasures. So you know you there'll, there'll be plenty of incentive to use big missiles for funny stuff, but also you have limits. Uh, and you know because there are other limits, there's still shit like you know reason why you would use a, a you know a normal gun that shoots bullets in space because well. Uh, Relatively, bullets are slow, uh, but they uh, have a very great uh, power to uh, weight ratio, do a lot of thrust, and are very good at armor penetration. You know what's not good at armor penetration? Lasers. So, you know, all these kind of trade-offs. So I'm, I'm still thinking about that one. But yeah, that's, uh, that's about where my bullet points end. We've got about 20 minutes before, like I said, Lucky's planned thing. But I don't got anything more on my show notes. We managed to make this show go for about two and a half hours. Raw. It'll 
crunch down smaller. Uh, let's see. I already asked Lucky if he had anything he wanted to bring up, and you were you you got that out there. So yeah, I no, think I think we're good then. It again. So we'll we'll wind up the outro, which is good. We're getting a little. I I ate dinner a little earlier to make our time frame, so I'm a little. I could use a little snack here after my instant space noodles. Instant space noodles. Yeah, we're gonna be back to rain on Sunday. We're scheduled up. That's gonna be interesting. Luckily, I pre note all my pre wrote all my notes ahead of time, so I, I don't have to like shift my brain that much. But it'll be be interesting to shift shift back into rain mode. But we're getting set up for. You guys should probably be in the grand melee before the session is over. So that'll be there'll, there'll be plenty of uh of meat to chew on there. All right, but let's uh run the outro. So uh, if you like this video, like it. Leave your comments below. Join our Discord. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. Join our channel memberships for membership badges and emotes. If you want to see what we're doing later, you know, stay tuned. Sub, ring the bell, all that stuff. Uh, we should be back next Monday for another Astrobot stream. That stream is very popular, and we had a lot of fun doing it. So we'll be capturing more bots next to Tim. Oh, I should say I did get all Astrobots, and I have started playing that. So nice. Yes. Yeah, it's a rad game. It's a video game ass game. Um, but yeah, that'll be our next stream up. Uh, we did not do Fail Betrayal last week because we had a couple people sub out, but. Hopefully we'll be back on schedule next Tuesday, and if not, I'll do something. Um, and like I said, we'll be we'll be back in Wednesday for some more stuff in Final Fantasy fourteen as well. So that's our streaming schedule projected for the week upcoming. Like I said, make sure you're subbed and ring the bell so you always know when we're posting them streams or videos. Uh, for Let's Talk FGO things, I think next week we'll do our pregame for the uh, October event for for you know uh, Dragon Girls Water Margin because like I said, it seems like they're probably gonna launch it you know middle of. Uh, second week in October, maybe not, but it seems like you know with the the uh, five point two uh, road to seven ending on like the seventh of October seems like a good time frame. So stay tuned for that as well. That means I'll probably have to run up some wanteds this month if I can. So uh, like I said, keep your eyes peeled for all that stuff, and uh, we'll be seeing you guys later. And do also remember to consider supporting us on Patreon. Like I said at the beginning of the show, get access to episodes early and in audio format and more. Most memberships start at a dollar a month, so uh, have all that fun there, and uh, I guess I'll be seeing you guys next, Tim. Next time. Space Truckers out. Over. <laughs>